before we get started with those presentations and the instructions for those presentations, I wanted to um, introduce a few people to start off with. So not to make the RU presenters nervous, but we have um, with us today Jan Weisenberger, who is the uh, Associate Vice President for the Office of Research with us today. Um, Jan, you've been up here for these RU presentations both the last three years, maybe? At least. At yeah. least three I years. Four years. I come every year to hear you guys present. Always tell because I learned a ton Great. So we're, we're happy to have um, her here today. I also have been made aware that we have a couple of awards that we're going to distribute today also. Do we have an order of operations here? Who would like to go first? Be my pleasure. Roger, why don't you come up and, and, and tell us what you got going on. Well, I have decided to continue a long tradition started by Dr. Hogart for uh, students in field zoology. We do a lot of collections. I decided that I would follow this up, so I checked into, you know, what had to be done to do this. And uh, by the uh, authority of the <laughs> authority of the Universitatum Committeorum <laughs> and the Societas Studium Loquendi e Pluribus Unum, I am honored this year to present the Mad Collector Award for 2015 to Helena Fox. Now, at first Helena was rather ruthless, but she had a soft side at, at the end, but it was too late. The order was in. But here you go, Helena. Look at that. <laughs> she did relent later in the season and give a few butterflies a break. I don't know if, it was, know if I'd say it was deserved it or undeserved it, but anyhow, that's for Helen. She was wild and crazy in the field. So. And Matt, it's my understanding we have a, a running plaque from Dr. Ho Dr. Hogarth. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah, we have. It's in your classroom right now, I yeah. assume. Yeah, it's still in the classroom. And her name will probably be on that for, for the There's years. a space yep. for, for the student's name. That's right. So we'll have that engraved down in the Columbus office, and your name will be forever etched in the Mad Collector Award. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for presenting that, Roger. Yes, sir. And then, Tom Simon, I believe we're going to call yes. you up. Yes, I have a here. faculty award. Yes, I have a faculty award. Uh, this particular individual has uh, demonstrated excellence in the face of danger. Uh, and as many of you know, Africa, the dark continent, was settled by the brave efforts of one man, Colonel William Patterson. If it hadn't been for Patterson's bravery, he was commissioned by the Queen to build a bridge over at Sabo. Sabo was the last connection point for the railroad to make it across the continent. During the midst of the uh, building of the bridge, there was a major problem that happened. Two lions started to terrorize the villagers and basically pulled humans out of their tents, out of their quarters, and killed them, eat, eat them. Uh, we suffered similar situation here this, uh, this year. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to break past it that Dr. Doug Kane would come forward. Uh, the Certificate Appreciation, the Colonel Patterson Award for the Ghost in the Darkness, <laughs> awarded to Douglas Kane for outstanding display of hunting skills and eliminating Stone Cottage of two ghosts that savaged the cottage during the summer of 
the rules of engagement for this evening and tell you how things are going to flow for. All right, all right so your, um, the order's here. Time, we're already starting a little bit behind. <laughs> but, so, um, after you get started, I'm going to stand up after 10 minutes. And after 12 minutes, I'm going to kind of start waving. And then <laughs> at, at 15 minutes, that's when we have to cut you off. So I'll stand up at 10 minutes, and I'll wave my hand at 12 minutes. I hope we have, hopefully we leave enough time for questions, but if not, we'll move on. Okay. Question. Question. question you would break. That's yeah. right. Intentionally. Okay. And after the fifth presenter, we'll have a, a ten minute break. Oh, and this order is was decided um, the opposite of the food chain. <laughs> Starting at six and working our way down. <laughs> I'm Jeffrey Hayes, and tonight I'll be speaking on the variation in Lake Erie water snake uh, juvenile size differences, or juvenile size between two sites. Uh, but before I dive in, I'd like to mention a few things about its background. Um, first, I'd like to point out how different the Lake Erie water snake is from the northern water snake. The Lake Erie water snake is actually a subspecies of the northern water snake. Uh, additionally, it's a non-venomous live-bearing snake. Uh, it's endemic to the Lake Erie Islands in the Western Basin. And it was uh, listed uh, recently, actually, under the, the Endangered Species Act as a threatened species. It has since been delisted and became the 23rd uh, species to ever be delisted, or species. Uh, it is still threatened in Ohio, and it's endangered in Canada. The primary threats to the species are human persecution, uh, anthropogenic disturbance, habitat loss, predation, uh, things like that. And these all have a synergistic effect, but uh, it's, they're further compounded by small population size and uh, relatively small geographic distribution. In fact, it's less than 40 kilometers in diameter, and that's one of the smallest distributions uh, of any species. So uh, that's, that has a large effect um, when considering the other threats. Um, some recovery efforts have been undertaken to uh, restore Lake Erie pop, uh, water snake populations. Um, they were affected. As I mentioned, it was delisted. Those included public outreach, education, uh, habitat protection, um, and things along those lines. But continued monitoring is sort of where um, one area where I found my niche in this the greater scheme of things. This is a very large project. But another thing that benefited the Lake Erie water snake was the introduction of the round goby. The round goby, I'm sure. We all know all about the round goby, and we all know that the, the snake benefited from that, but uh, the ways that it benefits are important for me. Uh, originally, the snake's diet was um, native fishes, amphibians, things like that. Now, of course, it's 92% round goby or greater, um, but that's really allowed the snake to, um, or individuals to uh, attain larger body size, um, uh, higher reproduction, increases in survival, um, and things like that, growth rate especially. So we know a few other things. So that's, that's important, but um, you know, I'm kind of narrowing this down in, to, to what I specifically did. And one of the things that was important for me is to look at survival. Uh, the survival among islands of Lake Erie water snakes is pretty similar for females. For males, um, at North Bass Island, specifically, it's 10% uh, less than other islands. Um, but a previous student, uh, an REU student, um, uh, researched um, something similar to what I'm researching. He was looking at gro uh, growth rate differences in neonates. Um, and he did find significant differences in snout vent length. 
uh, which I'll explain what that actually means soon, but um, he did find significant differences between sites uh, for neonates. So that kind of um, is sort of what my study is built on. And the reason for this variation is it's not really known at this point. We don't know um, a lot of the, the answers to that big question why, but uh, we do, we have some preliminary data that um, causes us to think uh, that this may have something to do with human densities near sample sites and specifically its effect on uh, predator densities um, near sample sites. So this is the data. This is another RU student from the past who uh, looked at um, the relationship between human densities and predatory bird uh, densities, the great blue heron, for example. And she found that where human densities were high, predatory bird uh, densities were low. And so if you're looking at two sites, one with a lot of people and one with uh, rel relatively few people, um, you could extrapolate that, uh, according to this, that um, at the, the site with a higher human density, there's going to be less predatory birds. And that's the great blue heron in action. So why are younger snake uh, classes important? Um, really, they're important because not a lot is known about the Lake Erie water snake in terms of younger uh, individuals, younger snakes. Um, and so this is important really for, if, you're, if you really want to understand the population dynamics of this, uh, um, uh, of this population or the island populations, um, then you really need to start looking at the younger snakes. What's going on with them? How's their survival? That's going to influence a lot of things. Uh, but the problem is, is that they're difficult to find. They have a, a really low recapture rate. Um, it's, a, it's around 0.13, but can be as high as 0.53, which 0.53, that doesn't sound durable, but it's a big, a big range. So, and that can also vary by year. So there, there are some advantages to working with the Lake Erie water snake, uh, specifically as a whole. Um, probably the, the biggest reason is that they exist at really high densities. I mean, we've all been walking down the shore. We've all uh, seen snakes, and probably our first day we were a little, you know, we, we stepped back a little, but we're probably all desensitized now to uh, the site of snake. Um, I am, at least. But uh, <laughs> the, the overall project, the big project, has been going on for 30 plus years, and there are over 32,000 capture records. That makes it one of the longest running and largest population studies of snakes in the entire world. That's a big deal, and that gives us a lot of uh, data to play with. But with all of this data, there's still Neonates and juveniles are still um, grossly underrepresented, you know. So we need to do more research to learn more about them. So I hypothesize that there, are, there is variation between um, uh, Lake Erie water snake neonate size between sites. And I predicted, or between islands in our case, but I predicted that North Bass Island will have larger uh, neonates and juveniles than South Bass Island. So how did I do this? Well, uh, initially we chose two sample sites. Again, North Bass Island, which, um, where's, the, where's the laser thing? Okay, so North Bass Island is there, South Bass is here. Uh, a lot of us are familiar, but our uh, site on North Bass was on the south shore and our site on South Bass was on the southwestern shore. This is the site at South Bass. Um, as you can see, there's evidence of human activity. There's a lot of human activity. Jet skis, boats, uh, people, a road, parking lot. And this is North Bass. It's pretty secluded. There's not a lot of people there. Um, and this is, I, I, there have been times in sampling where we've gone and haven't seen another person. So when we get to our site, we uh, visually search shoreline. We lift to cover objects, uh, rocks, logs, um, rubber mats, and even looked in vending machines. We found some snakes in vending machines. This was on a tip, um, and I said, they said, hey, we've got some snakes. I said, hey, I'll take them. So, uh, and this is what we were after. We collected every snake, and we processed every snake, but these are the ones that we were looking for. Um, these are neonates and juveniles, little guys. 
And so once we had them, we took measurements, snout vent length, which, which is a measure from its, um, the snake's snout, which is uh, right there, and then its vent, which is back here. Um, we took uh, a mass measurement. We looked at different banding patterns, of which there are three, and we um, scanned them for pit tags. A lot of them do have pit tags, but the new ones uh, we had to tag. So, so I tagged uh, all snakes on North Bass Island, adults received a pit tag. Uh, juveniles and neonates received a mini pit tag. Um, South Bass Island adults uh, were, only adults from South Bass Island were pit tagged. So I did have some problems, as many of you know. I talked about, you know, some of those at various, on various occasions. But um, the sesh, uh, that's what this image is of. And I really like this dock sticking out of the water right here. That's, that really just, you know, it's nostalgic for me. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, heavy winds also created some, um, some you know, waves that uh, we didn't really want to risk, um, you know, getting into. Uh, it, it kind of created unsafe conditions, so we couldn't go to some sites on some occasions. There were, like, there were a lot of cool nights. Um, we missed, you know, a lot of sampling days. Around half, I think, I, I added it up, I think it was around half of our sampling days, but there was also some tampering with some of our cover objects, which um, was pretty much uh, a wasted sample day. So the results, um, this is what, what I found. I collected 51 total snakes on North Bass and 18 total on South Bass, uh, and the data was combined because it was somewhat low, lower than I would like, that it, we combined it with um, some data from earlier in 2015. Uh, and then we did um, an analysis of variance to test for any differences in mean body size uh, measures, especially between sites and between uh, sexes. Uh, in the 2015 data, we found no significant difference. Um, uh, so we decided we would um, expand our pool, and so we pulled data from 2012 to 2015. Uh, in doing this, we did find significant differences between the two. Um, or between sites, uh, but we also, um, because we knew that uh, there tends to be annual variation in adult uh, snake size, we went ahead and um, added in a, a uh, year and a site-by-year interaction variable, and we, uh, we found that there was no significant difference by site, but by year, there was, uh, the, the difference was significant. Um, so that tells us that any um, future work done uh, with the Lake Erie water snake, especially looking at size, you, we really need to take into account um, annual variation. That's a, a big factor. We don't know why that is, but site isn't a strong enough predictor uh, to base our work on entirely. So this is a summary of everything, no significant difference for the 2015 data, but the pooled data was significant. Um, and so for the future, as I mentioned, we need to consider weather uh, as a factor or at least other things that vary by year. The weather varies by year, food abundance. Um, but we also need to include more sample sites. We can't just use two islands. Um, it, had I had more time, I would have used uh, many islands, but um, as many as possible. But after all that, thank you. <laughs> and I can take any questions. Um, so the banding, observing the banding patterns is something, and so a lot of what I did actually was uh, for future work. It wasn't all just for me. Um, so I was looking at banding patterns um, because that's, that's what we do, I guess. Um, but there are three. One is unbanded, one is an intermediate between banded and unbanded, and one is banded. Um, and so there is actually, uh, I had no idea that there was such variation, but there is. And so we recorded that um, in our data. And um, I think I, I did read a paper about um, uh, banding patterns and some evolutionary mechanisms. So, uh, and actually, Dr. Marshall uh, uh, you know, talked about Slack a little bit. So. But yeah, that's, 
that's one thing. And then the, between the juveniles and neonates, um, neonates, let's see if I can get this straight. Uh, neonates were, um, we were looking for snakes under 250 millimeters. Um, that was kind of like the, the high end. That was our max. So anything under that was considered a uh, neonate. Um, and then for juveniles, um, it depended on whether it was a male or a female. Um, and I, I cannot uh, recall what those measurements were um, at the time, but I can find out for you. Yeah. What's that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions? I have time for one more question. And while we do that, can we switch live speakers? Um, so I, I saw you, so you pit tagged both the adults and neonates on North Bass, but only adults in South Bass. Was that, what was the reason for not tagging? This is a, um, this is a money thing. Uh, so <laughs> one of those, one of those, uh, you know, uh, I, I guess it's a lack of money. They're expensive. They're expensive. Um, and it's, I'm not sure why we tag all uh, snakes on North Bass, but, um, yeah, we did not tag any fins on South Bass. So, uh, I think they were, they were around $6 a piece or something like that. About five. five. How, how easy was it for you to get them on North Bass versus South Bass? Oh, neonates? Yeah. Oh, gosh. It was, uh, I mean, it doesn't look like, I mean, it, yeah. It was a lot easier to get small snakes on North Bass than it was on South Bass. So, so then, when we're throwing tags in, so yeah, there, there were occasions where we didn't find any on San Jose. We didn't find any neonates, so, um, so yeah. All right. Next up is Liz Ignatiak, who comes from Diana, Ohio State, Don, Ohio State, <laughs> Dine, Ohio State, one of those. Uh, she apparently was not bitten by a mess chicken in her own work, so she came here to get bitten by some more and cardinals too. And she's going to tell us about the spinal bird. So, welcome, Liz. So, as Dr. Marshall said, I did my RE project on survival of the Bass Island birds. And Ohio has uh, 403 different bird species, 200 of which breed in Ohio. And Ohio has so many because it provides a migratory path for the birds and breeding habitat. And the Bass Islands are important because a lot of the birds need to stop and refuel before they can fly across Lake Erie up into Canada because it's a very far distance for the little birds. And many different groups, like the Nature Conservancy, acquire land to protect the Lake Erie shoreline. And this protected land provides a variety of habitat for mig migrating and breeding bird species. And this is important because thousands of visitors come up to Lake Erie to bird watch, and the bird watchers visiting the Lake Erie spend $26 million each year on like food, lodging, and travel. And money is being set aside to buy these preserves that the bird watchers come and visit. And we want to know if the birds are more likely to survive in the preserves. So our goal was to look at the differences in survival rates of bird species on the different bass islands and look to see if the bird species and preserves have a higher survival rate compared to the human-dominated areas. In the bottom left picture, yeah, this is Chief Preserve on South Bass Island, and this is the vineyards up on North Bass. And these are our, we have five different uh, locations, Bayview offices, Gibraltar Island, Middle Bass Island, and North Bass Island were all banded by uh, Dr. Marshall's evolution class. And then me and Dr. Marshall banded on Chief Preserve, Gibraltar Island, Middle Bass Island, North Bass Island. And we went out and we set up eight to 10 poles. And these are two and a half meter high poles and these are six meters long or 12 meters long with a mist nut in, bet in between them. And you set them up between vegetation so the birds, as they're flying between different areas, they don't see it. It's really hard to see, it's almost like invisible. And they fly right into it and they get all tangled up. And then you go around you untangle the birds, you bag them, then you get all the birds, band them with a unique number, and record specific information about them, like species, sex, wind length, weight, age, and fat amount. 
and then you release the birds and hope that you will catch the band of birds another year. And this bird right here is a very angry uh, eastern kingbird we caught on Gibraltar Saturday, last Saturday. And this is a picture of the net. You can see the two poles with the mist nuts in between and the knee untangling a uh, downy woodpecker hatchling. And then this is a cedar waxwing from Gibraltar and me weighing a red winged blackbird male on Gibraltar too. And then we ran the data from 2011 to 2015 through MARC, which is a mark and recapture program. And it looks at the probabilities that the birds survive from year to year and the probabilities that we can recapture the birds when they go back out. Just because they survive doesn't mean we're going to be able to capture them again when we go back out. And we ran five models to see which model fit the data best. We ran one set of models for different islands and one set of models to compare human dominated versus preserve areas. And we looked at the differences in survival rates among the islands and human and human dominated areas compared to preserves. And we wanted to find the model that best explains the survival rate of the bird species. This word is very strange, the AIC information criteria, AIC, is the measure of relative quality of model for a given set of data and it provides means for model selection. The model at the top of the table has the best quality, and the AIC weight is the probability that a given model is the best model in the set of models. And these are our results. Uh, from 2010 to 2015, 1,935 birds are banded and 33 different species are banded. And this year, we banded 216 birds and 24 species. The two most common birds that we ran the analysis on were the red-winged blackbird and the American robin, and they had recapture rates of 2 and 3 percent. So male red-winged blackbird, female red-winged blackbird, and then American robin. And this pie chart just shows all the different bird species that we caught and the abundance of them, and this shows you that the red-winged blackbird is by far the most abundant compared to any of the other species, even the American robin, which is the second most abundant. And some of the species that are like way up here, really tiny slivers, we only caught once in the five years. Like this year we caught uh, at least flycatcher and American red star. Some more pictures of all the different birds. We caught some warbling vireos, eastern phoebes, the baby tree swallow, Baltimore oriole, at least flycatcher, and the common grapple. And then this is a table that you get for all the different models that we ran for the islands. These, the two models at the top are the best two. The AIC with the lowest score is the best model and any model that is within two of those is equally likely to have happened. And this model, okay, it's kind of confusing, but it's saying that for survival rate, island is important independent of time and for recapture rate, island is important. And this means that all the different islands had different recapture rates and survival rates, but the rates didn't change over time. So they stayed consistent throughout the whole time. And the second model is the opposite. So all the islands had the same survival rate and recapture rate, but they changed from year to year. And this shows the American robin survival rates based on islands. Bayview office had the highest survival rate, but it also had very large confidence intervals. And sheep preserve that's over on South Bass had like 1% survival rate. And this is, shows how the survival rates change over time. And from year to year, the birds have a different survival rate. And this shows the human dominated areas versus the preserves. And the human dominated versus preserves, um, the time is the best indicator of the data, and it shows that from year to year the survival rate changes, but it's the same for the habitat. And the, for the second one, the habitats change, are different, but from over year to year they stay the same. And this just shows the survival rate based on whether it was a human area, a human dominated area, like the vineyards up on North Bass or Preserve. And for the red-winged blackbirds, we got no useful information. None of these models are good indicators of the survival rates. This 
just shows that uh, the survival rate is dependent on island and year, meaning it's different on every island. On every island, it changes from year to year. So you, it's not very useful for us. And same for the human versus dominated. Human dominated versus preserved areas. And our estimates were poor because of very few recaptures. We only had like 2 to 3 percent recapture rate, and to use MARC, you're supposed to have around 10 percent to get good models. And our estimates were biased below the actual number because hatchier birds were included. And hatchier birds migrate to new sites the second year, so you won't find them again at your site. And right down here is a baby red-winged blackbird that we banded on Gibraltar. And the survival rates likely differ between the islands because each island has different habitats, and different bird species prefer different habitats. Habitats. Red winged blackbirds live along waterways and robins live in like forests. And each island has different uh, predators. And Savage and Davis found an American robin survival rate of 67% in woodlots. And we found a 76% survival rate in the Bayview offices and a 57% survival rate in the human dominated areas. But we had a really large com um, confidence interval. So it's not a very useful estimate. And this is likely because we had so few recaptures. And Bankhauser found red winged blackbird survival rate of 51 or 53 percent, depending on sampling technique. And we didn't even get a good or useful survival rate for the red winged blackbirds. And the data tells us that American robins and human dominated sites have a higher survival rate compared to preserves. But we do not know how much better because human dominated sites survival rates had a large confidence interval and um, low recapture rates. And in the future, something to think about for the next students who would be continuing on with the expanding data, which would remove the hatchlings from the data when they run the models because they mess up the probabilities because they're never going to return and we know they're not going to return, so we shouldn't include them. And we have to find a better way, a more efficient way to recapture the birds really uncommon to recapture them, and you need a 10% recapture rate to get good models. And uh, I would like to thank Dr. Marshall for all the information he's given me on banding. The evolution class, whose banding information I also use, Jeffrey and Nate, uh, they helped us out on North Bass carrying equipment around and helping us collect birds the one day. The boat captains for getting us to the site till like 7 in the morning, and Stone Labs and the Friends of Stone Lab for this opportunity. Any questions? Uh, we have about four minutes for questions. How long do some of these birds live? Um, only a couple of years, usually. I found one red winged blackbird that lived for like three years. It was recaptured like three years later after it was first banded. So probably most of the ones from that first banding time won't be alive anymore. Yeah. Now, right? Probably not. It's a lot of truncating data to help. That help? I thought it would help because they definitely don't survive for that long. Yeah, normally. Two part question. So, how many times did you sample each site? And do you think that if you would focus on a couple fewer sites, that perhaps you could get higher recapture rates? If we focus on fewer sites, we probably would be able to get more recapture rates because the weather is a big factor in capturing the birds. If it's really sunny out, the birds can see the net and they don't fly into it. So that affects it. And I think some sites I sampled three times and other times only twice because two of the days we couldn't go out because of the weather. If it's raining, you can't go out because it stresses out the birds if they're just sitting in the nets getting soaking wet. Chief, we got a really a lot of cool things in Chief. Gibraltar, probably Chief and Gibraltar, so the top two, and then North Bass, the least. Hot and a lot of a lot of mosquitoes up on North Bass. <laughs> 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 so I'm following along with the picture here, but like when you're weighing birds, like how do you actually do that without them flying away? You are holding them as you're taking the measurements and you tar the little weighing container kind of just like put their heads in there and their wings all in there so they can't fly out. They kind of try to back up. You kind of got to hold them down sometimes. <laughs> put your hand over them so they don't fly away. 
How do you measure fat content? I saw that on the slide. You blow on you blow on the skin to lift the feathers up, and the fat's like yellow, and you can see it's a scale. You mentioned that the survival rates were better in the human areas. Why do you think that is? I don't. That might be just because we did it for the American robins. We found that it was that they just the habitat is better in the human dominated areas compared to the nature preserves. So we can't know for sure because to begin with our estimates aren't very good. Yeah. So the confidence intervals and everything. So we're not 100 percent sure that that's even right. A decision of the robin eating junk food or something. No. <laughs> <laughs> they could be. Uh, what do you think the fact that the the hatchlings in your model, how much better do you think your model would perform if you were to take those hatchlings out? Um, a little, but not that much because it's not to catch tons of hatchlings. It's more towards the end of the season when the hatchlings are leaving the nest and starting to fly and they can't fly very well, so they hit the nest more often. But we don't catch them all that often to begin with, but just for future people, just so they know. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> is walleye spawning mortality. So why are walleye important? In Lake Erie, they're a keystone predator, and they also support large and recreational fisheries uh, throughout the lake. So spawning mortality, why is it important to understand this? It helps researchers understand the lake demographics of uh, walleye, and it also gives us more uh, information for, to help manage walleye populations. So methods. Uh, so we collected uh, over a year and a half period, or uh, we collected uh, 165 fish, and we uh, or we traced their movement over a year and a half period. And there was 100 males and uh, 65 females. Uh, fish were an anesthetized by uh, electricity, and it just kind of knocks them out and. Uh, Surgery takes place, and we put in a little transmitter in there as well. So the fish were observed uh, throughout the year and a half period, and there was 37,000 uh, data points that each one, each time, over a 90-second period, give or take 30 seconds, they uh, each data point is collected on a receiver nearby, uh, if there's one in the area. And we recreated, recreated the movements of every fish to see where they went and what they did. And we determined which fish survived the spawning period in 2014. And they mate on reefs, by the way. So, and they're uh, lithophilic, which means they're rock loving. And so that's where we determined, or I looked at specifically for spawning mortality. So, here's some of the equipment we use. And it's a VR2 receiver that, or sorry, telemetry is the transmission of sound signals through water, and it sends uh, data to the receivers. And the VR2 receiver was put on a buoy-like thing, and it had a cement anchor that was on the bottom, but the buoy was still connected. And the command unit uh, sends down a signal, and it releases a magnetic lever, which and the buoy floats up to the surface, where it's manually collected by us in a boat. So that's me collecting the buoy with the VR2 uh, receiver on it, which can be uploaded to a uh, computer to get, get, gather all the data. It's heavy. <laughs> all right, so here is an overview of Lake Erie and where some of the receivers are. I grouped them together into uh, several categories. And 
just to give you an idea, that's where we are, and this is the reef that I uh, was looking at spawning mortality at. And here's an view of how many receivers there are. So if a walleye went within 750 meters of that area, it uh, sent back a, a tag sample. And here's an example of how it works with the receivers on the bottom, uh, so no one can mess with them. And also the fish uh, transmitters, every time they go within that 750 meter range, then it uh, collects the data for us. So what are the criteria for determining spawning mortality? So if, there, if we see a fish is, has prolonged uh, transmissions on one receiver, we can uh, safely determine that it died there and it just keeps bouncing back and forth over and over and over again. Or if we never see the fish again for a long period of time, uh, or it was harvested by anglers. And there's an external tag on each fish, and if it is caught by an angler, they can report it and they actually get $100 for that and give back the tag and stuff. So my first research question, what percentage of fish released in spring of 2013 showed up a year and a half later on the reefs? So my hypothesis was approximately 70% of the fish released, uh, released would show back up because they're, um, they have a high percentage of spawning, or um, sorry, survival rate. And so my second research question was, what percentage of fish show, that showed up on the reefs in 2014 survived the spawning period? Um, and I would say a high percentage because on the reefs we don't actually see a bunch of dead walleye floating to the surface, so we would assume it's pretty high during the spawning period. And their spawning period is uh, during the spring. So what I did in my data is that I had to determine make a determination of how long the spawning period was. So I did the spring, which is March, April, and May. So my third research question, did male and female exhibit uh, different mortality rates? And my initial hypothesis without knowing anything was that males and females exhibit similar mortality rates. And how long do male and female spend on the reef during the spawning period? And I would assume that they are similar. So for my results, okay? The first research question, what percentage of fish released in spring showed up a year and a half later in the Western Basin Reefs? So 88 out of the 165 fish, uh, 42 male, or females and 46 males showed up. So we can assume that they come back in similar proportion. And that's an example of the rocky bottom of one of the reefs that they spawn on. Um, what percentage of the fish showed up at, and survived the 2014 spawning period? Uh, 79 out of our 88 fish survived the spawning period. Did males and females exhibit different mortality rates? So this is pretty interesting. 10% of the walleye that showed up on the reefs died due to spawning mortality. Two of them were females and seven were males. So mortality, we can conclude that mortality rates were three times higher than for males. How long do male and female walleye spend on the reefs during a spawning period? Well, on average, we found that males spend around 33 days and females for a shorter period of time was only 10 days. So we can conclude from this is 10% spawning mortality was determined. Uh, mortality was three times higher in males than females. And the reason behind this is that males are, uh, they stay on the reefs longer, so they're more, they're exploited more easily and they, they lose their energy more because they're constantly battling for positions on the reef. And females stay off the reefs from previous studies, uh, we've determined that uh, females kind of linger off outside of the range of the reefs and come in for short periods of time to spawn. So for management implications, this helps us uh, better understand population demographics and can help us, uh, it's useful for stock assessment models. So I'd like to thank Dr. Vandergu for everything uh, in the High Department of Natural Resources and then also Stone Laboratory for everything. I'm truly grateful for being here. fishing for walleye during the spring season. And, but it just keeps getting just a 
attacked real hard, so they've never been able to um, like limit like a certain fishing period of time after the spring, after they all mate and stuff. But um, so they tried to do that, and then but it just isn't working. So I would say that would be like if they could put in place a period where there's no fishing for walleye. Actually, in the, um, the 
Sandusky River, they're removing a Fallville Dam, and they're going to do mortality rates after that is removed eventually. So they're going to do how many fish go up their spawn, if it's affecting the fish down the stream, like in Lake Erie, and what the mortality rates are for that. I think they're going to do that in the future. So. Any other questions? Yep. Yes, yeah, sorry. Last question. So what happens when you go so quick for your talk? We get some yeah, sorry. Really good questions. Oh, it's good. Yeah, it's a great talk. So I want to actually come back to build on what Dr. Steinhardt said. So if they're on the on the reef for three times longer, and the mortality was three times higher, you're saying that the females they kind of stage off of that reef and they come yeah. up just for little bouts. Yep. Do you have such a receiver array that you're still picking up that female off the reef? Then, or um. Or does she totally so, disappear? So, sometimes she does and sometimes she doesn't. That's like the best I could say. So sometimes they go far keeping, enough. Okay, off. but if you are keeping them somewhat close to the reef, they're not on those. Well, places. actually, yeah, sorry, I answered that question wrong. They would to totally be off the detector. They would totally be off the detector. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ellen Warfield. Ellen is a sophomore going into her junior year at Ohio State, at the Ohio State University. Excuse me, I almost made a mistake. I had the name wrong. That's what happens when you come to that school of more. Uh, <laughs> Ellen has been doing a terrific job in my lab. She has been working night and day, literally, uh, work, uh, collecting data for an experiment that we ran. And I'm very excited to have her share her results with you. So, Ellen, take it away. So I studied the round goby, and we did a lab experiment. So first, I'll give you some background information. As most of you probably know, the round goby is an invasive species. It's native to the Black and Caspian Seas in Central Eurasia. And it showed up in the St. Clair River around 1990. And then by 1994, it was pretty well established in Lake Erie. And so now it's estimated that over a billion are living in Lake Erie alone. And the the fact that they can live in such a range of water qualities, they don't need pristine water, uh, kind of helps with the fact the idea of how much they have spread. And so there have been some benefits that have been seen from them being here. It's not totally all dire. So the sport fish, such as walleye and smallmouth bass, do feed on them. And then the Lake Erie water snake has seen a resurgence as the brown goby are a main food source for them. And also zebra and quagga mussels, which are also invasive from the same region. They do feed on them, and so that helps keep that um, population in check. But even with these benefits, the benefits do come with a little bit of an extra point to them. I mean, for instance, the bivalves, they do filter the water, so there are contaminants in them. So when the gobies eat them, then larger fish, such as the walleye, eat them, and then we eat the walleye. It does go up the food chain. So there is some trade-offs there that we have to look at. And then there are further consequences. Uh, they do dominate the benthic habitat, wiping out around 26 benthic species that are native here, and we haven't seen a lot of them now. Um, the log perch are struggling right now, and then the mottled sculpin has been pretty much wiped out. So that's a good example. And then also uh, fish eggs, the smallmouth bass, they do feed on the eggs, and that kind of puts a little hardship on that population. So there have def definitely been some strong consequences for the ecosystem because of that. So when I was starting my project, I was going to look at which substrate or which like sand, gravel, or cobble, where they habitat, where they like to live. And there has been a previous study by another REU named Andrew Steyer. And he just looked strictly at whether they preferred cobble, gravel, or sand without any other factors such as food. And he found that they pretty much always chose cobble. It was a pretty strong uh, correlation. And even split up between male and female, you can see that cobble was definitely the preferred substrate. And then he also looked at whether they uh, preferred to be buried or on the surface. And burying is um, a resting behavior. And so we'll talk a little more about that later. But he did find out that most of the time they were buried rather than on the surface. So in my experiment, I wanted to see, take it a step further and see how food relates to all of this. So I was looking again at whether they chose sand, gravel, or cobble, what, where did they like to live, and then can food choice change where they are? So will they pick something different other than cobble? So to set this up, I have my three substrates, sand, gravel, and cobble. 
I had three observation periods during the night, during the day, and then in the evening. And then for the food, I used mussels because that is a lot of uh, research has shown that that is a preferred food item for them. So I had small, medium, large, and extra large. And then I split them up into two size groups, an intermediate size and a large. We didn't use small because previous studies have shown they, they just don't have the pharyngeal, pharyngeal teeth to eat the small muscles, so it wouldn't really be a good um, factor to show. And then, of course, we did male and female, and then whether they were coastal or open water fish. So first, to collect all the specimens, we collected open water fish through trawling out in the middle of the lake, and that's just driving a boat with a big net to catch fish behind it. And then along the coast, we collected fish through seining, and two people are on each end of a net pulling it to shore, once again, to catch fish. And then through trawling, we could also get the mussels I needed. And then along shore, you could also look for rocks, which those who have helped me knew it was a trying process. But then, once we had all of our specimens, we could bring them back to the lab. And to set it up, we had um, each tank had the three different substrates equally spaced out. And then we had 30 tanks total with this in it, and one fish per tank. And then 40 mussels were added to each tank, 10 for each of the four size categories. And before putting them in the tank, we took each size category and measured the smallest and largest. And that way we could find a mean for each size category for each tank. And then once they were in, we let the trial go for 24 hours. I came in three times during that 24-hour period in the night and the daytime and then in the evening. And then I just wrote down where they were in the tank, if they were on the sand, the gravel, or the cobble. And then I also wrote down whether they were on the surface of that or if they were buried within. And then after the 24-hour period was over, I could take the fish out of the tank. I could drain the water down, find all of the mussels that were left. And from that, the ones that were missing, I would know that the gobies ate. And then the gobies that we took out were euthanized with MS222 and formalin. And we measured their total length, their standard length, and their weight. And then at that time, we did uh, write down their sex. And then based on that, we were able to get some results. So when you take all of the fish from the study, we found that there was no preference, nothing significant. They seemed to be on the sand, gravel, and cobble a pretty much equal amount of time when we looked. And even when we split this up between male and female, it was about equal for everything. So when it does get a little more interesting when we then look at coastal and open water fish, you can see that um, the cobble and gravel were preferred over sand for the coastal fish, but then once again, when we look at open water, there wasn't any significant difference. So then when we look at size, we could also see that cobble was greater than sand, it was chose more than sand, but then for the larger fish, there once again wasn't a significant difference. But even with the differences that we did see, they weren't anything extraordinary. And if we look back at Andrews on the bottom, we can see how just how much more the cobble was. So even when we did see a greater preference for cobble, it wasn't that significant of a difference. And then, once again, if we show it with male and female, you can just see the major difference about how a shift has been happened. So then we also look at my buried and surface. You do see a major difference here with the fact that most of his fish were buried and most of mine were on the surface. And so if we look back now at how bearing is a resting position, we can see that it would make sense that there is food in the tank. They are going to be more active. They're going to be on the surface. They're not going to be hiding. And then also, you can split that out by time of day. And this can kind of maybe give us a better idea of when they are feeding. So if we look in the evening time, they are not buried very often. So that means they are more active. So they may be eating more in the evening. And then if we look during the day, that is where the highest rates of varying happen. So that may, have, may show a little bit about how they're resting more during the day. And then lastly, if we look at a predation index, that kind of shows um, that fish, the larger fish should be eating larger mussels. That would be what is expected. And if you look at the bottom, you can see in a previous study, it was the same thing, only with different, not the same substrate all across. So it had all the mussels, but there wasn't a difference in substrates. And you saw that the larger the fish, the larger the item that was eaten. And then if you 
look at mine, you see that there really was no correlation at all. The bigger and smaller fish, they were eating the same. So I guess you could say we, there might be something with the fact that if multiple substrates are in close vicinity, that it causes the fish to forage differently than if they were in a, a big area with one substrate. So going back, let's a summary of all of the conclusions. The food takes priority over ha preferred habitat. So, I mean, before we saw that their preferred habitat was cobble, but now with food additive, that's not necessarily the case anymore. And more time is spent in active mode rather than buried, which once again makes sense because they will be looking for food. And then with multiple substrates present, there is a change in foraging behavior from what we would normally see. And so looking forward at uh, future research, we need to think more about what this means about the uh, round goby population in Lake Erie. So as I stated before, they've been in the lake for 20 years now. They've become a large part of the ecosystem. So at what point do they reach a carrying capacity? And at what point do their natural areas, if they prefer cobble, at what point does it become too crowded? And are they willing to go to different areas to eat more food? And based on this data, it seems to show that they are willing, like if there is another area with more space and more food, they are willing to go in that, to that area. So this kind of can apply to all the Great Lakes, as they're found in all the Great Lakes. And as we're moving forward and looking at, you know, moving into the Mississippi water drainage and how we are going to manage all of this, I mean, it may not be an idea to wipe them out, but, you know, there is an example of the National Park Service um, setting up um, on Lake Michigan, they're kind of like restoring shorelines. And once they think about the kind of substrate that they want to put down, this can kind of give an idea about when and where uh, gobies are resting, uh, when they're feeding, and if multiple substrates are near each other, what this means. So overall, this just helps us understand the ecosystem dynamics and how an invasive species can relate. And moving forward, we'll just kind of think about these things. So acknowledgments. Just thank you to Ohio Sea Grant, Friends of Stone Lab, and then Matt, Kevin, Chase, Nicole, Tom, and Nikki. They definitely helped me a lot getting the things I needed. I know that maybe it, sometimes it was a lot. Um, and then Captain's Art and Craig for helping take us places to trawl to get the fish we needed. And then Dr. Simon, of course, for helping me along the way, supporting me, and the theology class. They helped a lot with the collection. Oh, okay, so each tank did have 10 of each size, and then when they were sprinkled in, it was just, like, sprinkled evenly across, and then... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, the gobies. So we tried keeping an equal number of, like, the intermediate and then the large gobies, so that at least that would be a kind of equal, and then that worked pretty well. It might be interesting, just because they were so close together. So, I mean, it's kind of hard to tell, I mean, if it's in only a space this big, if they're really moving, what that means. So I suppose that this is a good starting place, and it would be interesting to see them to move to a larger scale if the same data the icon holds true. Uh, It might be interesting to see. I mean, definitely I would wonder if they would react to seeing something like that. How long did you starve them before they uh, went in the, to feed? Um, we tried doing it around like 24 hours. So we would get them and then we would probably usually hold them for that day and then start the experiment. Because I've always wondered when I've done similar stuff is, I mean, you're holding them to kind of give them that acclimation and to make sure they haven't eaten for so long. Mm -hmm. But uh, we don't know the history of that gooby. If it was chowing down for, you know, a day, just or, uh, <laughs> or if it was, you know, not 
meaning at all. So I, I was wonder if there's a, can you think of a way to figure that out? Um, I mean, I think it would be interesting, like, maybe if you split up and then you did part of the tanks, like, the normal, the way that we've all been doing it, where they are starved, and then maybe you took some straight out and put them in so that they weren't, they were eating, like, normal, and then see if there's a difference between the two. Cool. Thanks. And one more. So did you have, so did each trial have the go consuming muscles, or were there some where no muscles? All of mine did have muscles, but Andrew's was the same exact setup as mine with the different substrates, and he did not have muscles. So then I could compare my data to his and kind of have. Okay. But after 24 hours, was oh. there ever a time when you broke it down and there weren't? There was and never no muscles. Some of the categories did have none. A lot of times the small ones would have none, but there was never where all four you were gone. I had the pleasure of having two students this year, and I can say they both were delighted to have. Uh, my second student is Felicia Brady. Felicia is a senior at, at my home state in Indiana. She's at Earlham College, and Earlham is known as one of our finest schools. And I'm very happy to have had her. She's been working very diligently on aging growth. Only after when she got here, she found out that her project wasn't going to be able to be completed. So she has had to be the most flexible and start from basically square one once she hit the ground here in the summer. So I'm very proud of what she's been able to accomplish and I look forward to having her share some, some very interesting results that we found. So Felicia, go ahead. All right. Okay, so Dr. Simon definitely takes pride in any out-of-state students, of course, because he gets a lot of wrath uh, <laughs> from where he's from. So. All right, so as you can see here by my title, I was looking to the age and growth of round goby, Neogobius melanostomus, here in the Western Basin, and specifically looking at the difference between shoreline and open water or deep habitat. So Ellen's already kind of introduced you to the round goby, but just to remind you to let it sink in, uh, the round goby is native to Central Eurasia, and it's a bottom-dwelling or benthic fish, and some interesting things about it is that it has a very plastic ability to adapt to many different kinds of food resources or environments. It's actually urihaline, which means that it can live both in saltwater and marine habitats and in freshwater and like a range in between. And it's also very aggressive. And so, as you can imagine, that's kind of a recipe for a perfect invasive species. So when it was introduced here in Lake Erie in the 1990s, as you might imagine, its population has exploded. And so, some impacts of that have been that other fish um, can't compete with around goby in terms of being able to live in different kinds of habitats, and gobies will literally force them out of their nests or their homes, and are also not able to reproduce as quickly. Also, one thing to mention is that round goby can spawn several times a year all throughout the warm season. So those guys are just, they're hard at their biological role in surviving, so they're very good at it. So some species that have been affected by them are darters, sculpins, the log perch. And so, but an interesting thing to consider is that all, not everything that they've done has been negative here in Lake Erie, but their impacts have also been to be a great food resource for the Lake Erie water snake and to bring it back from being a threatened species, being a great food resource as well for smallmouth bass, walleye, other predatory fish. And then, as Ellen mentioned, they also prey on zebra and quagga mussels, which are invasive. So if anything, we can just gather that they have positive and negative impacts here in Lake Erie, but we do know that they're, because they're in such abundance, their role here is very complex and very important. So if a change happens in a population, we want to know what's going on with that, because clearly, in either habitat, um, something's going to be affected by them. So some kind of questions that Dr. Simon helped me guide as we began my project was to think about um, kind of going off a lot of data that people have been doing in their REUs here for the last few years and kind of wonder if there might be a difference between shoreline habitats and in deep water habitats and see just how their, how their populations compare um, in terms of length and weight and condition. And also, after thinking about that, to wonder if hypoxia and low dissolved oxygen levels might have had an effect on those deep water gobies. 
as you know, the limnology kids will, or the algae kids will talk about how much that's really been an issue in the last few years. And in general, just to wonder how is their population doing? Are they, um, are they still like going at this rate with which they had when they first came to Lake Erie? Are they still exploding, or are they kind of reaching a cap on, on how much you know they can keep re reproducing? And so, just to answer these questions. So we sampled both in deep water and open water, or deep water and shoreline habitat by trawling, staining, angling. Um, a lot of little kids at the ABC caught fish for us. So thank you to them, first of all. So we caught 348 deep water individuals and 303 shoreline individuals, so a lot of fish. And our work, once we brought them back to the lab, was to take their total and standard length and their weight. So after going through all of that, we found that their sex ratio was usually a little bit in favor of the males, um, which was interesting when looking at previous data that sometimes the ratio would be two to one or even more than two to one. And so it kind of shows that it's stabilizing a little bit. So this is their length-weight relationship of the gobies of this year. You can see we had kind of a monster up here. Here's a big guy. And when we take the log of both their, their mass and their length, this is the regression equation for, for them. And so when we compare between shoreline and deep water, and we look at the slope, what we interpret from that often in fisheries is a B value. And that kind of talks about the growth of the fish over time. And so if it maintains its exact shape, like it didn't get skinnier or fatter as it grew, it would be a 3. Most fish are around a 3 or often positive. And so gobies are one of those. So meaning that as they grow older, they also get a little fatter in size. And so as you can see, they are, again, positive as what historical data has shown, um, but the data for deep water shows that they are a little chubbier out there. They're putting on a little bit more weight as they grow. So when we look at the length frequency distribution, um, it's pretty obvious that there are a lot of fish that are between around 45 and 65 millimeters. So those are pretty little guys. And as you can see, it tapers out once you get to the larger fish. So when we compare it to Past years, when we look at this is data from Scott, who was an RU last year, and in 2006, actually most of the fish were around 80 to 100 millimeters. They were a lot bigger, and in 2008, 2014, we've just seen a shift to a lot smaller individuals. And mine is just kind of re-emphasizing that pattern. We've got a lot of small, really small guys, and not so many big guys. And I do want to mention that um, it was kind of a bias in that we we're angling from the ABC because only larger gobies can catch those worms off those hooks. So really, had we not even done that, but just stained in the shoreline habitat, we, we really didn't get any big fish from, from staining. So um, definitely a lot of small fish. So when we look at relative mass index, this is something that, like a standard mass index has been created for a lot of fish species that kind of um, tells about their weight, their weight relationship. Um, for all, like, all species universally. And so that was created in 2011 for the goby. And when we look at relative mass index to that, um, if it's over 100%, it's doing really well. It's a good, healthy individual. And if it's lower, then it's not doing well. And so my data showed that it was actually not even at 30% of that relative mass or that standard mass index. So they were really pretty thin, not doing so well. But as you can see, it's a little bit higher in deep water. So the cool part, once we got past weighing and measuring those 600 fish, so a lot of fish out there, we, uh, we got to aging these fish. So the scale method has been widely used for aging fish and has been shown to be accurate for gobies. And basically what it is, if you're not familiar, um, a fish's scales are a lot like the rings on a tree. So Whenever the fish is small and it first develops its scales, as it grows, its scales grow as well. And so each day, and as it grows, it puts on these rings. And then if the growth is really good, then the rings are far apart, the goby's doing well. When they're close together, it means that it's like a time of stress, not getting a lot of food, or pretty much in winter time. So 
What we look at when you see the scale here, this is the picture I took through a microscope. Um, we've got the focus here, which is at the bottom of the scale, which is where all the rays come out from. And then our annuli are what are formed kind of in circles around that focus. And so pretty much the measurements that I would take was from the total scale length from tip to tip, from the focus to the end, and that each, at each annuli. And that definitely took some practice to be able to see those. But this is really helpful because once we have that data, so we can actually measure it through the microscope, how far it is from the focus to this annuli, from this annuli to the next one. And so you can kind of get an idea of that history of that fish just from one scale. And so once we have that, we can do a lot with it. So we did that for 50 shoreline individuals and for 50 deep water individuals. And the ones that we chose, we kind of had a strategy for it. We chose the five smallest from shoreline, and then the 15 largest, and then 30 randomly selected ones in the middle. And so while that wasn't a completely random sample, we wanted to get an idea of like how is this population, how has it been over the last few years. And so obviously if we had all small fish, we wouldn't know more than a year or two. So once we had these lengths, from focus to edge and between each of the annuli. And if we had their length at capture, then using that proportion, we can kind of back calculate, oh, this is how long this fish was when it was this old and this old, which can give us a lot of information about their growth rate. So this is just a table of that data that I collected with their mean length at capture, with their length at all of their annuli going back. So. What this gave us was some interesting information about their growth rates. And this is something that takes into account that, that slope or that D value I talked about before. And so as you can see, it's a lot higher in the deep water and lower in the shoreline. And the age class frequency, just to kind of get an idea of how old are these fish, we saw a lot of one-year-old fish and then going down from there, not as many, which is quite different from another student two years ago in 2011, who found that for deep water, she found literally no zero and one year old fish. So we've got a lot of young fish in the deep water. And so this is Fulton's Condition Index, which looks at the general health of the population that's widely used. And we can see that um, in the deep water, again, values are higher. And those were indeed significant for each of those age classes. So at each age class, pretty much the offshore was winning over the shoreline habitat. And this is comparing with the RU from last year. And so when we look at Fulton's Condition Index, mine lies even just below each of these years, just not even hitting two. So pretty poor. So in summary, um, just to kind of bring it all together, we've seen a shift from larger individuals to smaller individuals. The fish are getting smaller. and We've seen overall poor conditions, something that's illustrated by Fulton's Condition Index, the, the growth rates and the relative, max index, relative mass index. And so um, both in both habitats, but especially in the shoreline habitat. And then we've seen an influx of smaller fish, younger fish into that deep water. And so, and then I just, I have to throw out that like even just when we were in the field and through visual observation, these fish were really small and really skinny. And even going on throughout the season, it seemed that way. Um, they would come in and they often, we had a hard time even keeping them alive for Ellen's experiment because they would die if they didn't have food right away. And so they were definitely hungry and hollow bellied. And so just from what people have seen over the past few years, like, wow, that goby looks really different, or is that a goby even? They're really small. So um, things that can be studied in the future is to really question if hypoxia might be affecting those deep water zones and see if what might be going on is that these fish get wiped out whenever there's a dead zone or a really low levels reach, and that might be why there's room and habitat for these smaller, younger fish to flow in. Um, which, is a, which is definitely a possibility. And then also to consider, I don't think anyone has really delved into the effects of cyanobacteria or microcystis, um, microcystin on the round goby. And so see if that's affecting them. And then continue with Ellen's work on their habitat and diet preference and see if 
where they are is really random, if there's a reason, if there's a certain place that they want to be and something's forcing them out, then we can just get an idea of what, what their population dynamics are. So I'd like to thank Ohio Sea Grant for making this possible, for all of the staff, Dr. Simon, for all of his help over the last five weeks, and especially just the staff. Um, we were always asking for equipment or for more gobies or more equipment or more tape or whatever it was, and people were super helpful, and especially to my classmates and other kids here who have helped me count those several hundred gobies. So thank you so much. So it looks like with your and Ellen's data right before this that we may be seeing food limitation in the gobies. Uh, and with, uh, with that, uh, it goes along with the mussel populations that have kind of come down and the gobies might be dropping those. Um, it, you found in literature any other invaded areas where they have gobies and mussels? Where are the food Um. I, I guess I can say I haven't found anything like that. That's something I would have to look into more. Um, but I think you have something novel for Lake Erie that I haven't seen anymore. So I, haven't seen I haven't heard about that. But I would, I do feel like, um, I mean, just, I mean, I was so surprised the first time that we stained and you just pull in so many fish. And I mean, they're definitely covering the shoreline especially, and I can imagine that they are definitely experiencing competition for those mussels. Yeah, and the trolls, we used to get so many gobies, and now, you know, sometimes you get none. Yep. What do you think the effect of all those predators are, too? <laughs> 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 Is there an inside joke here about snakes? I don't know. <laughs> The well, effect of the predators the thing, on them. Right? Well, it's not just the snakes, right? There's right. lots of things eating yeah. gobies now. Yeah. So what what effect are your predators having on your on your size classes? So I guess that's something to definitely think about. Um, that is, they're getting more popular on the menu for snakes or for predatory fish or whatever that they can't live as long. And so that's definitely, I think, as other species become more aware of them, then it's like they're a staple. But Definitely, I mean, we have to take it into account that their condition, just for one individual, is not great, which isn't so much expressed by predatory pressure, but that they're skinny, their mass is really low for their length, and so, I mean, that's definitely a factor, I think, but I think there's some more to that, I would say. I don't know. Am I right in seeing that this year's data is half the Was it when I had the kind of plot? Yeah. your announcement before I bring up um, Aaron Monaco from our office. Okay. Um, we'll have a couple announcements. First of all, people that are in my class, we will be back with your Christmas present. Um, class starting till 9 a.m. in this room. So you can finish up the presentation. Please let people know that if they aren't here, tell them or else they'll come up here and be wondering where everyone is. The um, thing I wanted to that way and some this way um, for the REUs and their supervisors, but also for 
two good opportunities um, to present. Remember, for the REUs, the C grant will support your presenting at a conference, not in Hawaii. Um, uh, and these one is, and neither of these are in Hawaii. The uh, next year's Ohio Academy of Science meeting is at a place near and dear to Dr. Winslow, um, Ohio University, in April, and the, the 125th one, so it's going to be a big shindig and we get to go to Athens. Um, the other conference is the International Association for Great Lakes Research. That is in Guelph, Ontario, probably less familiar to everyone here. It's kind of like uh, if you go north of Lake Erie and west of Lake Ontario where those lines would be. Um, but it's within driving distance again. So, um, Think about those. What? Where's Meeks this year? That's another good one. Yeah, that's, I had, and I was going to say that these aren't the only two where people have presented or could present. Uh, there's lots of other ones, but I don't know where Meek is. Oh, yeah. So for those in the audience, Meek is the Midwest Ecology and Evolution Conference, and it's primarily geared towards uh, graduate students that are oftentimes early in their research, so don't even have you know, the end results yet in undergrad presentations. And it's actually, I would say, 80% of the audience is dominated by other grad students. It's not a lot of, you know, professors. So it's a very relaxing, comfortable place to kind of present. So Yeah, Ohio Academy, I'd say, has more undergrads. But I, I think uh, at, at Iagla this last year, there was some even a high school student that I thought was like a master's student. It was like, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> cheaper. <laughs> cheaper. <laughs> and then before we let you wander around for uh, a 10 minute break here, I want to introduce uh, a, a staff member from our Ohio Sea Grant office, but many of you may actually recognize her. Her name's Erin Monaco, and, and she helps a lot with our um, education and outreach program, among many other things. Um, but we have, and I don't want to steal all your thunder, there is a, a OSU club that is dedicated to kind of the mission that, that Stone Lab has. Um, and that club is kind of. <coughs> Um, the last board members kind of fell off and didn't find replacements. So Erin is here to kind of pick up that charge again and get a student group started. So I want her to kind of introduce that opportunity to you. Uh, like all of you, I'm also a Stone Lab alumni. I was up here in 2012 for about eight weeks taking classes and workshops. Um, and I heard uh, Friends of Stone Lab being mentioned a lot tonight. And this is called Buckeye Friends of Stone Lab. We call it Buckeye Fossil for short. And um, it's an all-student-run organization. And I'm really excited to take this on because when I was up here, um, I made lots of really close friends. And I still am in contact with them today. And it's a great way to stay involved with the lab. Um, and so some of the ideas I have going forward with the group um, is to do some educational visits, uh, going to the wetlands, um, going to a water treatment plant, going to a fish hatchery, doing a zoo tour. Um, also, um, coming up maybe carpooling to these Thursday night lectures or having our own lectures and we can have different uh, researchers come and be guests of ours. Um, another idea I have is uh, fundraising for scholarships so that other kids out there can get the same opportunities that you had. And for that, um, you know, we could design our own T-shirt and sell that. We could do the restaurant thing where you just pass out flyers and we get like 10% of the proceeds then. Um, I'd also like to get some recruitment so people know about Stone Lab and the opportunities that you had up there. Um, you know, at different involvement fairs, we could go and visit different schools and give presentations. Um, I'd like to see some community service happen, so doing river cleanup, street cleanup, uh, coming up and doing our own work weekends, you know, um, the dorms need changed over, things need fixed, things need painted. Um, and then finally, fun stuff, um, you know, going to ecological centers or I thought we could do like a fishing lure workshop where we can tie our own lures and then go fishing on a weekend or something. So, and I'm definitely open to other ideas, but these are just some starting points. Uh, my email is up on the board there. Um, I'll be here all night if you have any questions. Or if you don't remember that, you could also email uh, stonelab at osu.edu, and I check that one as well. So thank you.
Erin's a graduate of Ohio State University, and she's been on some of the OSU clubs. And, and we talk about this when we talk with this club. Um, we don't want it to be something that you're just like, oh, I'm going to get in another club at OSU so I can put it on my resume. She's really excited about making this an active, engaged group. So if you want to, you know, there isn't an executive board right now. We need a president, a treasurer, a secretary. You know, if you want a board position and you just want to stay connected to what happens at the island, please reach out to Erin and see if we can get that going. Just I know we're a little off schedule. Do we still want to give 10 minutes? Get let people walk around? Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. So let's get back here at uh, quarter till, and then we'll start up with the last five presentations we have. After sorting through thousands of killer chat, she still feels that way. Mm. Literally thousands. <laughs> All right. What? Literally thousands. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So today I'm going to talk to you guys about um, fish access into wetlands and how to best, um, basically, to improve it or make it the most efficient. Okay. And there's the laser. Okay, so over 80% of Lake Erie fauna spawn in coastal wetlands. They're important because they're a link between the aquatic and terrestrial habitats. Um, and they're very protected. They're shallow, they're warm, they're nutrient dense. So they're great places for all kinds of plants and animals to live. Um, runoff from the land brings nutrients into the water and there's plants that will soak it up. So if a wetland is draining into a river or Lake Erie, it ends up with um, cleaner, a little bit nutrient poorer water going into the bigger bodies of water. And we've heard enough about algal blooms to think that's probably a good thing, right? Um, and also, very importantly, fish spawn in wetlands because it's shallow, it's nutrient dense, it's warm, it's calm. That's where they'd, they'd like to spawn. So the problem is we like to live by the water, whether it's ocean or fresh water. So when we settle here, often wetlands are degraded, whether it's indirect or direct, and they're often destroyed as well. So only 10% of Lake Erie, <laughs> original Lake Erie wetlands are currently existing today. And what happens when we do settle around them is we, we often put what we think are great ideas to get around, um, but like the paying culvert, fish really can't swim up it. And then when there's like a heavy rain event and it's, the water's literally like blasting that rock, there's no way a fish can get up. So it really just hinders fish movement. So then the solution, oh, go back. The solution is that in 2005, um, or part of the solution, the Great Lakes Regional Collaboration um, was created, which allocated $20 billion to be spent in the next 15 years for restoration, cleanup. Um, think about invasive species coming in, we're just being more and more aware of how important wetlands are, and I guess the dynamics within them. So this project started at this place, um, and you'll see a bigger map in a little bit, the Chief St. River, and there's this, uh, what looks like a field. It's a wetland, I promise. I was there, in the water. Um, so uh, so there's, what they did is the Nature Conservancy built a fish ladder right there where that, where that marker is. And so they flooded it, built the fish ladder, um, and then it looks like this. So we drive in here along this road, and we drive over this like concrete pad, and then underneath, looking into the wetland, looking this way, is the fish ladder. You see, it kind of a fish can jump between these and uh, go up elevation into the wetland. So that's where it started. Um, but then it kind of grew, and now there's there's funding from the Lake Erie Protection Fund, the Nature Conservancy, and the Ohio Sea Grant, um, and so it was expanded to be three sites not just um, plow sea, and then three sampling periods. There's a spring, and there's a summer, and there's a fall. So the goal of the whole project is to see what's the most effective structure that fish can get through so that you get the most fish in the wetland because we know the fish need the wetland. So there's that bigger map I promised you. So we're right up here on Putten Bay, a little near it, Gibraltar. There's that um, first site I was talking about. Our second site, Great Egret, I don't know what happened to my PowerPoint here. There's Great Egret, and then Winus Point is down here. Those are our three sites. So I'll give you details now on Great Egret and Winus Point. So there it was. There's the, this is Great Egret. So this is the marsh, and the culvert is right in here, and this opens to the harbor. So we would set inside and outside the culvert. Um, and this culvert is typically 75 to 100% full of water literally under muddy, turbid water. There's no way to get a picture of it. 
Um, so this is an image I found online, but it's a similar, um, like a metal pipe that goes through it's a similar construction. Um, and then that other site, Winus Point, has a swing gate. So once again, we go over this road, and it's, it's this road, and it's underneath it. So it's this big, the gate can lift, and then there's these little swing gates down here that will let water out, so it flows out, um, and then they shut, and water can't get back in. So this is, I found this one on the internet to show you kind of a little bit of a close-up. I will open one way and then shut the other way. That's how it's designed. So what we did is we set nets. There's me and Aaron in the boat. This is what our nets look like in the water. So we set them um, for overnight collection, and then we came back the next day, and we got all the fish out of the net. Um, I knew I was going to get wet, so I was in my swimsuit and waders, which were fun to wear. And then so we identified them, count how many there were, and then measured the length and weight. That was the plan until Lake Erie weather, right? Lake Erie and enormous amounts of rain, and it's to quantify that a little bit. Remember our site here, the Portage River is right here, and in Elmore, Ohio, there's a USGS um, station that monitored discharge at the Portage River. And in 2014, these are the numbers. So it's discharge in cubic feet per second, and then the dates which were ranging from April 20th to July 20th, because that encompassed both the spring and summer uh, sample periods. And so you can see between 100 and 1,000 cubic feet per second for most of the of the spring. A little bit of a spike when you know June rains come. But in 2015, so we've got discharge per cu cubic feet per second. Now see how the scale changed. Like these numbers aren't even on this scale. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. it's pretty much the same throughout here. But then once we hit you know starting in June, it's just crazy, right? So a lot of discharge from the Portage River. And then we had a sesh, so it did disrupt our sampling. So you'll see some of the data is missing from our sample periods because of those conditions. So we got complete spring sampling because the weather was just fine, but then uh, only partial because you can see that's like where some of the highest spikes were. All right, so now we'll look at the diversity of the three sites. Remember, it was Blousey, Great Egret, and um, Linus Point. So at the fish ladder at Blousey, um, we got, we collected all the fish, we counted them, and then we came up with these numbers. So the Shannon Weiner Index measures um, diversity. So the higher the number, the better diversity. So let's say this number might represent a thousand of gizzard shad, and you know a couple handful of another species, right? So it's not great diversity. There's a, a spike in one population, and then Jacquard similarity. Um, if that's high, if it's 100%, it means you have the same amount of species on both sides of whatever you're measuring, in our case, a fish ladder or a culvert or whatever. So this shows you the similarity between the two. Now the rest of that graph, so those numbers are just the same. So it's, once again, our, our sampling. So we had three spring dates and two summer. Well, we tried. Um, late April, May, and then in July, the wetland and the riverside. And this is like comparing the two. So at the fish ladder, about 20, 25 percent, roughly. And then this one, we couldn't set the net, so we couldn't get a Jacquard's number. And once again, see the fish ladder in the spring. So in the wetland, main catches were brown bullhead and black crappie. And in the river, the main catches were emerald shiner and long nosed gar. And then in the summer, in the wetland, our main catches were common carp and black crappie, and then gizzard shad and white perch. So this structure favors stronger swimmers because of how it's designed. You saw they kind of have to leap up, so a very a smaller, a not as muscular fish, it's harder for them to get up a fish ladder. So then switching to the culvert now, the one that's always underwater. Um, once again, we couldn't set the nets this day, but we have all the other numbers, and our, our percentages varied a little bit more here. Um, they kind of jumped around, but we have some interestingly high numbers. Um, and then so we have in the spring, in the harbor, our major catches were blunt nosed minnows and bluegills. In the marsh was brown bullhead and bluegill. And then in the summer, um, in the harbor, mainly gizzard shad and bluegill. And then they definitely get through, right? Gizzard shad in huge numbers and white perch. And you can see, like a lot of those were gizzard shad. There were a lot. Um, all right. And then 
the nature of the culvert is it's more passive. It doesn't have that active jumping. So the fish that can get through hypothetically are more diverse, um, and like smaller ones can get through a little bit easier. And then our third site, Winus Point, with the swing gate. Um, this one, there was no way we could set any nets in the summer. So all we have is spring data here because it was literally just too high. Um, but then our percentages here, very little bit, kind of similar to the Blousey site. Um, so then in, we only have the spring data. So um, you can see the catches are just pretty small, right? Because and brown bullhead and white crappie are highest catches out here. And then in the canal that leads to bigger wetlands, brown or yellow bullhead and bluegill are major catches. And the swing gate isn't designed for fish passage. It was, we kind of used it as a control because water would flow out, the gates would shut, the fish aren't, if water can't get through, the fish can't get through. So our, we expected kind of low catches um, and it worked, it worked kind of as a control. Then if we compare the three structures using the Jacquard similarity um, percentages that we were looking at, remember the 20, 25% and then the one that varied and then the three sample dates from um, there and then once again, disrupting my data, it's all that rain. When we average those percentages for this fish ladder, we get 25, culvert 39, and the swing gate got 23%. Keep in mind though that the way the fish ladder is designed, the water comes out of the wetland, the fish swim up it. So the water's flowing out of the wetland. Same with the swing gate, the water goes in, I'm sorry, the water goes out and then it doesn't allow it back in. The culvert, however, it's just a metal pipe, right? So water can flow in and out, and it has, depending on the day and just being there on different days, you see, oh, this day it's floating, floating in or flowing out. So that may have made the percentage a little bit higher. Some fish could have just gotten swept up in the, in the water. So um, kind of to sum it up, we did see seasonality early on. You saw like it wasn't like always gizzard chat that we caught. It was a lot of different fish and the majority coming in and out. Um, we saw more adults in spring and then young of year. A lot of little fish, like that big. And you had to look at tiny little features to figure out what they were, which is fun. Found a lot of those in summer. Um, like right, white crappie, gizzard shad, white perch, large one bass. And these are a couple that I'm going to have here on this slide. Um, if you're familiar or unfamiliar. Um, the fish that are in the swing gate are not ideal for certain species like the long nose gar and the crappie because they're not, um, you know, this one doesn't allow many packs. And the fish ladder, a long nose gar isn't going to like get the momentum and swim up and jump, if you know what it looks like. It's pretty cool. It looks like it has a very large, well, long nose, right? <laughs> the culvert um, allowed more species uh, to move through, bullhead, carp, suckers, gizzard, shad, and I have a couple of those up here. Um, we just saw more, more movement through the culvert. Um, so then, in conclusion, remember that this study is ongoing. It is summer. Two sampling periods of the three. Um, our path. So based on the data we have, the swing gate restricted the most fish, which is kind of expected, it's not about fish passage. The fish ladder restricted some just because of the nature of the device, and then the culvert pretty much allowed the most passage through. So then a well-designed culvert at this point is probably the best recommendation. Um, something like this with a natural bottom or with little resting places um, for the fish to get through. It's probably, probably a good direction based on the data so far. So then I'd like to thank all of these people and some awesome volunteers in the field. They were a lot of fun to work with. Um, so any questions? Um, which, do you remember which site it was? Was it Blousey? I believe it was the one at the ladder. The one at the ladder? Yeah. I, I think it was the river that had the high. Yeah. 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 Outside, 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 outside the wetland it was high. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it means that it's outside it and it didn't go up the fish ladder, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. That's a good catch though because it was interesting to see the, the variation, right? Um, no, it's a good, it's a good question. Oh, it was like good. A, it was some of these, some of these, uh, I would guess the reason there's in some of these cases a reason why they have a particular structure. Um, obviously, with the swing gate, they don't for some reason want water flowing back in. Is 
got a similar case for the fish ladder. Do they not want water backing up into the wetland? I think, well, both are about the, the water level control. Um, and like the fish ladder especially, it kind of can increase like an elevation, um, which can be useful if you have like an elevated wetland. Um, was it, why did they build the structures? Yeah, right, well, I guess I, it, it's interesting just to, you know, I haven't really spent any time there, but, you know, obviously maybe some of these aren't, maybe, maybe they weren't, I don't know, natural wetlands to begin with. They were, right. So they're, they're, they're constructing them, but I guess it seems, it seems kind of interesting from the perspective of one of the things about these wetlands is their connectedness to the lake mm -hmm. and that, you know, if you know, like think about a, a estuary, one of the things we hear about the estuary is the water going in, coming out, going back in with the tide. Mm -hmm. Yet in our construction of the wetlands in the Great Lakes, we seem to be maybe wanting to control water in a different way, which makes you wonder if those wetlands are really being constructed in a useful manner. It's true. I mean, we, we don't have tides to deal with, but we have sessions. And those sessions can be very important for providing water to some types of wetlands that we have in the Great Lakes. That's true. That's true. I think maybe some, it's nice to have that control, but if the, the idea is to let fish through, what's important about this kind of study is it's like, well, if you really want fish to go in and spawn, it isn't just like put in a fish ladder to control the water. Um, it's kind of like a give or take. Um, or maybe there's a new structure out there that's yeah, great. There's other designs that exactly, there are. Thank you. All right. I know everyone's excited now. We're going to stop talking about fish and birds and snakes. And, and, this, and now we're going to enter the fasting world of primary productivity. Uh, so Michaela Barrett from Bowling Green State University. She's going into her junior year. And she's one of the students that had to um, scrap her first ideal project because of all the weather. And, and she's going to talk to us about, about excess nitrogen and Kentucky Bay. Well, all right. I am studying um, excess nitrogen in the Stusky Bay and seeing if it will stimulate plantothrix blooms. And I got the pleasure of working alongside uh, Dr. Justin Chapman this summer. So the whole the harmful algal blooms are a global, global issue. Uh, this is due to the increase of nutrient loading caused by humans. And as we all know, some cyanobacteria produce harmful toxins. There are negative human health effects, negative economic effects, and negative ecological effects. Some of the negative human health effects are skin irritation or um, nose liver damage if ingested. Some of the negative economic effects are for like water quality uh, treatment plants. It costs them an extra $10,000 a day um, just when a bloom is present to treat that water. Some negative ecological effects are just that it hurts the other uh, algae around it and it's negative, it has negative impacts on the food web. Um, so in fresh water, there's a paradigm saying that uh, phosphorus has always been the illuminating nutrient, but there's been recent, uh, recent literature that states that nitrogen is playing a, uh, larger, a larger role than we previously thought. Uh, there's a common debate about whether managing nitrogen is even important, just because there is end fixers in the water that can take uh, oxy or nitrogen and convert it into a nitrogen they can use. So it's, it's a question if uh, nitrogen, fix nitrogen fixation will compensate for the nitrogen limitation. Uh, some do acknowledge the nitrogen can limit the growth of phytoplankton, though. So I'm uh, concerned about Planktothrix, and Planktothrix is a filamentous cyanobacteria. It does not have heterocysts, which are the specialized cell that uh, can fix nitrogen. It does require combined nitrogen, like nitrate or urea. Um, it does, however, produce some, uh, the toxic called microcystin. It's not as common as microcystis. Uh, microcystis usually occurs in offshore, offshore Lake Erie blooms, but it does dominate bays and tributaries, but it's especially severe in the Sandusky Bay. So as I said, since blooms are always severe in Snusky Bay, and they're always dominated by Planktothrix. Um, you can see here that even when the blooms aren't bad, like in 2005 and 2002, they're still extremely uh, severe in the bay. Um, this is because the bay is incredibly shallow, and it's a well-mixed drained river mouth. And the Snusky River watershed is about 80% agricultural, so there is a lot of extra fertilizer runoff going into, the, into that bay. Um, Previous research has been done um, stating that nitrogen is a limiting 
nutrient in the um, CFP Bay for plankton bricks. So I'm wondering if you control nitrogen and phosphorus rather than just phosphorus, will there be benefits? And is there a synergy between the two? So my research questions are, will excess nitrogen result in higher growth than a constant N to P ratio? And will excess phosphorus result in higher growth than a constant N to P ratio? So I sampled on July 1st in the Sandusky East Basin. Uh, you can, oh, you can, I was right in there. Uh, you can't really see us, but we're over there. <laughs> so my methods were I took uh, dilution assays. Um, I took 100 milliliters of the lake water and 900 milliliters of uh, DI water. Uh, I, my goal for the dilution assay was to deplete the excess nutrients in the lake water. Originally, there was high levels of nitrate. So then, after being diluted, they were incubated for two days at 21.7 degrees Celsius to ensure nutrient depletion. And we chose 21.7 degrees Celsius because that was what the surface temperature was at our site that we sampled. Um, after, after the incubation, the micronutrients were replaced, like lithium and um, boron. Um, then the assays were enriched with varying concentrations of nitrogen and phosphorus based on a 20, 20 to 1 nat a nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. And then the reagents I used were in sodium phosphate and sodium nitrate. Uh, then we, using varying lab techniques, we tested for uh, nutrient concentrations, total chlorophyll, and total biomass, as well as microsystems. So I had three controls, and then I had three sets of, um, of sampling bottles. And the first 10, I had excess nitrogen. and the second 10, I had excess phosphorus. And in the final 10, I had an NP ratio of 20 to 1, which just showed kind of like equivalent amounts based on Redfield's ratio of nitrogen and phosphorus. That was just sort of as our baseline. Um, you can see here that for the excess nitrogen, we use an extremely high amount of nitrogen compared to very low amounts of phosphorus. But for the phosphorus, we did do increasing concentrations. And then oppositely, we did the same for excess phosphorus. So we, had heck, we had a lot of uh, phosphorus here and then increasing amounts of nitrogen. And then for our baseline, or NTP20, um, we did increasing concentrations at each level. So for our analysis techniques, we used the fluor probe. This just measures chlorophyll concentrations. It, um, it works by use, measuring uh, light wavelengths for color. Uh, it determines algae class for green algae, cyanobacteria, diatoms, and cryptophytes. We also use the flow cam. And I use this to, um, to determine my total biomass. It quantifies particles per milliliter, and basically it works like a microscope, except for it's fluid imaging. Uh, so you put a, sam a raw sample into the machine, and then it shoots the water through, and it takes pictures as it goes. And you're able to count each picture it takes and um, characterize them. We also use a nutrient analyzer. This just measures our nitrate, nitrate and phosphorus concentrations. And finally, we use a microsystem ELISA test and a biotech microplate reader to measure the microsystem levels. So it's actually a very fun task. So for all of my graphs, I have a series of graphs of, uh, soon. Uh, they all had a, sort of have the same um, uh, look here, where there's with an increase of growth, there's an increase of nutrient concentration. So we're here, we're just looking at growth rate using our biomass, uh, of our final biomass and our initial biomass over days of growth. So as you can see, that as you increase um, nutrients, so the growth will, growth will increase until it kind of tapers off because algae can only grow so much, with so much nutrients. Um, and later on, um, I focus on this Monad growth rate responses, where we look at the total, uh, the growth rate maximum compared to this KS here, which is the half of the maximum, um, and then it's like based off of it, the derivative of it. So we're concerned with the growth rate here. I also, for my graphs, I have a, a two sets of scenarios where the excess, um, if, if there's two, if there's two nutrients, so excess B being nutrient one, or B being nutrient one, and then A being the other nutrient. So if we have excess B nutrient and X, and then AB nutrient uh, ratio, then um, if excess if excess nutrient B is concentration is irrelevant is its outcome because the lines are the exact same. So this, in this case, the nutrient A is the only limited nutrient because excess having the excess B nutrient there did not cause any extra growth. Oppositely, if you have excess growth with excess B, 
that means that excess B is a limiting nutrient as well as uh, the A to B ratio. So nutrients A and B are both limited in this situation. So for microcystin, um, we had a very low uh, phosphorus, and phosphorus did not affect microcystin concentration. So you can see here that there, um, I don't even, there, I didn't have a good regression trend line. Um, so there's almost no relationship between uh, phosphorus and microcystin. The, the dots even kind of switch here. You go from high nitrogen to low growth. Uh, but oppositely, we have uh, increasing nitrogen concentrations lead to an increase in microcystin concentration. So since there is, since this line, the NP20 regression line, is higher than the line with excess phosphorus, that means that because there's a nitrogen uh, concentrations in this, sam this uh, sample, that led to more growth. So micro microsystem production is determined by nitrogen concentration, which leads us to believe that microsystem has a nitrogen limitation. Uh, for total biomass, excess nitrogen led to um, an increase in total biomass when comparing nitrogen to phosphorus 20. And then, so with more nitrogen, there's more growth. And then oppositely, when there's excess phosphorus, there's excess, there's more growth. So with um, so that leads us to a co-limitation where if one of the nutrients is in excess, then it'll grow more based on that nutrient. For chlorophyll, um, XSP and NP20 are very comparable. There are small differences um, at, the, at low po uh, phosphorus concentrations here, but they're very comparable for most of the line. However, you could still argue that because of these uh, differences here, there's a phosphorus limitation. And then for uh, when there's excess phosphorus, um, chlorophyll increased with nitrogen, and then the excess phosphorus and NP are very comparable still. They even cross. This suggests a nitrogen limitation. So this is another example of a co-limitation just because when there's excess P, there's more growth, and when there's excess N, there's more growth. Uh, there's also a debate about biomass and chlorophyll curves being slightly different. Uh, sometimes chlorophyll is not a very good indication of biomass, and this is one of those scenarios. So for a summary of my results, um, phosphorus concentration, for phosphorus concentration, biomass and chlorophyll both increased with P concentration regardless of nitrogen concentration. So that suggests when um, with excess nitrogen or with um, phosphorus concentration, there's a phosphorus limitation. And with uh, biomass and chlorophyll both increased with nitrogen concentration regardless of the phosphorus concentration. So this also suggests a nitrogen limitation. So overall, we have a true co-limitation where whatever nutrient is in excess is a nutrient that causes the phytoplankton to grow more. We also did calculated growth rates at given phosphorus concentrations using the Monod growth curves that I mentioned earlier. Uh, according to Annex 4, the Western Basin target for uh, phosphorus is now 15 micrograms per liter. So we ca I calculated the growth rates at target phosphorus concentrations and they show less growth at the NP of 20. But if you look at the 40% reduction, which is what the Annex 4 group would like to see, with, um, when you have excess N here and you limit the reduction of phosphorus, there's a dramatically de decrease. And the same goes for the NP of 20. It just decreases with the reduction. So as, a, as an overall like, summary, uh, excess N will result in a and higher growth than a constant NP ratio, and excess P will result in higher growth than a constant NP ratio. Uh, nitrogen is just as important as phosphorus in the Sandusky Bay, and in order to reduce planktothrix blooms, nitrogen and phosphorus will both need to be limited. Um, microcystin was related to nitrogen concentration, so if we would like to see a reduction in microcystin production, we need to reduce nitrogen concentration. Um, moving forward, more research needs to be done to determine if the end fixers are, will, able, will be able to counterbalance the reduction in nitrogen. And research also needs to be conducted to determine how to control these nitrogen levels. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Justin Chapin, Kat and Callie for helping us out in the lab, uh, Jen and Tom, and of course, Captain Craig. Thank you guys.
from the nitrogen. Do you think, would you describe that as biased, or do you think that would be a more, a more true representation of what might have really been going on in, in that system? Well, in that system at that time, it would find that it'd, it'd be representative. However, we were kind of looking at the way that the water fluctuates throughout the year, because at some points there is excess phosphorus, and at some points there's excess nitrogen, just based on how the runoff occurs. So under the, if, if you would have, if you would have run it under the current, under the, the natural conditions at that time, you think you would have, you would have concluded to, that you should limit both or limit only phosphorus? At that, I'm assuming at that time we would have seen a phosphorus limitation just because it wouldn't have needed any more nitrate. So we showed that nitrogen increased microcystin concentration. Why do you, why do you think that is? Uh, microcystin is composed of 14%. If you look at its molecular um, components, it's 14% nitrogen, which is um, so it needs it needs it needs the nitrate to even form itself. So if there's an excess, it doesn't form the toxin until there's excess nitrogen. So when there is um, so when there is excess nitrogen, it has the availability to form the toxin. Jen Marshall, who is also from Bowling Green State University, and she's going to continue on talking about nitrogen precipitation. <laughs> and I also want to point out that this would be a, a good helpful for uh, a, a, a good helpful for any any students writing a letter of recommendation, because in her in or I mean not letter of recommendation, but uh, a, a letter why you want to uh, like a letter of intent or whatever. Personal statement. Yeah, a personal statement. That's what I was trying to think of. So in Jen's personal statement, she specifically said she wanted to work in my lab and listen to my name. So <laughs> if, 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 you make, if you make something personal, that will get your reader's attention. And rather than using a general blanket, this I'm good because I'm great letter, but if you really tailor your, your letters to the people you're going to apply to, that, that shows your reader that uh, you really want to work there. So, there you go. Thanks for that introduction. Um, again, I'm Jen Marshall, and I was studying micronutrient limitation in the central basin of Lake Erie, um, and I walked with or worked with Dr. Justin Chaffin. Um, so I apologize for all of the repeated data, um, but I'm going to give you a little bit of background on the harmful algal blooms in Lake Erie once again. Um, major eutrophication began in, or began in the 1960s. Um, but the health of the lakes started to get better after the 1972 Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, um, which was a coordinated effort between the U.S. and Canada, and it reduced phosphorus inputs by 60 percent. Um, but these harmful algal blooms have started getting worse um, in the last couple decades, um, which led to the worst algal bloom that appeared in 2011, and a lot of people know about the total water crisis of 2014. Um, so. There's negative impacts with these harmful algal blooms. Um, they do, or they can produce toxins that, if ingested, can damage the liver, um, have gastrointestinal distress, or skin irritation, um, and it threatens the drinking water supply to over 11 million people in Lake Erie, or in the Lake Erie region. Um, and it raises the cost of drinking water treatment, um, like Michaela said, could be up to $10,000 a day. Um, and there is, um, because of the poor water quality, it decreases fishery production and also creates um, hypoxic zones in the lake. Uh, so these blooms are driven by nutrient loading um, from rivers like the Maumee. Um, and studies have identified phosphorus as the main limiting nutrient. But like Michaela's research has done um, and proven that fish does play a role. And some of my research has showed that iron um, molybdenum and boron also plays a role, um, but people did determine that before we started re researching it. Um, so like Michaela said, um, they're kind of concerned about whether um, nitrogen fixing can compensate for um, phosphorus enrichment. Um, so this is a study in Lake 227, which is in <coughs> northern Ontario, um, and it started in 1970. They 
excrete or enrich the lake with phosphorus and nitrogen. Um, and then in 1990, they only enriched it with phosphorus. So you can kind of see this decrease here in total nitrogen and in total chlorophyll. And then I'll kind of talk about what we think this might be caused by later on in my presentation. Uh, so there's been a lot of research done on the western basin, which is nutrient rich, and it's um, dominated by microcystis blooms, um, which are driven by phosphorus and nitrogen. But in the central basin, we're concerned with Dilithospermum, um, which is formerly known as Anabina. And you can see here, it's a filamentous blue-green algae. Um, and in the central basin, there's low phosphorus and high nitrogen con concentrations. Um, so it kind of needs micronutrients to aid in the uptake and fixation of nitrates or nitrogen because it's not bioavailable. Um, and here you can just see um, this is on July 11, 2015. Uh, this is the western basin and this is the central basin. And again, the western is dominated by microcystis, but the central is dominated by Dilistophermo. So our, our research questions were asking why does Dilistophermo? Um, bloom in the central basin of Lake Erie, and why does it lack heterocysts? Um, and these heterocysts are needed for nitrogen fixation. Um, so our hypothesis was just that heterocyst formation in the central basin is limited by the lack of boron. Uh, so a little bit more about the lithosperm. It's a potential nitrogen fixer. Here you can see um, this is just a filament of the lithosperm, but it does not have any heterocysts in it. So it wouldn't be able to uh, um, fix that nitrogen or use it. And since we see these in high nitrate containing water, it indicates that the nitrate is not bioavailable. Uh, and so micronutrients play a role. Um, their iron and molybdenum are needed for the uptake of nitrate, but boron is needed for the formation of heterocysts. And these heterocysts are these um, cells that contain no pigment, so you can easily identify them. Um, so here you see it without heterosis. These two filaments have heterosis in them. Um, and they can help the cells by allowing them to convert um, atmospheric nitrogen to ammonium. And um, the reason why we're studying it is because there's an unusually low number of heterosis present in the central basin. And we think that it's because of the lack of boron. Uh, so this is an ongoing project. Justin worked with some other students last year. Um, and from that, they concluded that phosphorus and boron yielded the highest amount of chlorophyll A. Um, and that or there were a lot of diatoms that were present, and boron was needed to form those diatom cell walls. Um, but the lithosperm was not present last year, so they couldn't answer the question about heterosis. Um, and so this year, we've actually done two um, sampling dates, um, one on June 10th and one on July 6th. I've been working with the experiment on July 6th. And then I actually analyzed some of the data from June 10th. And we were sampling from site Avon here in the central basin. And we took about 40 liters of water and brought it back to the lab. Uh, from that water, we created nutrient-rich bioassays. Um, and use these treatments that you can see here. So we had a control that just received dehydrated water, uh, phosphorus, ammonium, phosphorus and ammonium, phosphorus and iron, phosphorus and molybdenum, phosphorus and boron, um, phosphorus, ammonium, and then all of the micronutrients, and then phosphorus and nitrate. So we, uh, once we were done with those nutrient-rich bioassays, we put them in an incubator for five days. Um, on a light dark cycle. And we put it at 21 degrees Celsius just because that was the measured um, temperature at site Avon. And then after incubation, incubation, you can actually see the difference here. Um, this is just our control. It received five milliliters of deionized water. Um, but this one received one milliliter of phosphorus, ammonium, iron, molybdenum, boron. So you can see a lot of growth here. And to analyze these, um, for total chlorophyll and heterocysts and see how many heterocysts were present. Um, we used the fluoroprobes to measure um, just the total chlorophyll. And we also looked at green algae, blue-green algae, diatoms, and cryptophytes. 
but our main focus was the total core fill. And so this is from experiment one this year on June 10th. Uh, you can see that there's no significant difference in the growth of chlorophyll A um, or the chlorophyll A concentration um, between treatments. So by adding micronutrients or ammonium, you didn't see a significant amount of growth. And then here again, there wasn't a significant amount of growth um, between treatments when micronutrients were added. And then we used the flow cam, or flow cam to um, image these colonies. So we would send uh, the sample through the flow cam, and it would basically just take pictures of everything or all the organisms that pass through it. And then I actually went back, sorted them out, and then sat at the computer and counted each cell in every colony. <laughs> so that took a while. Um, and we quantified heterosis per cell, heterosis per milliliter, and then colony proportion or the total colonies with heterosis um, to a total colony. So because this um, process was so time consuming, we only analyzed some of the samples or some of the treatments. So we did the control phosphorus, phosphorus plus ammonium, phosphorus plus iron, and phosphorus plus boron. Um, and then the rest of the data I'll actually be looking at next week. Um, we preserved the samples with Google's and hopefully we'll still be able to see the heterosis. Um, so the results from this shows that um, the lack of heterosis is probably due to the lack of boron um, in the central basin. Uh, so you see a significant difference here um, in the heterosis per cell ratio um, when it was treated with phosphorus and boron. Here again, um, we quantified heterosis per milliliter, and there is a significant difference um, when treated with phosphorus and boron. And then finally, um, colony proportion, again, significant difference um, with phosphorus and boron. So from all of this, we kind of concluded that um, phosphorus is still the main limiting nutrient in the central basin, um, but there could be some nitrogen limitation due to the lack of bioavailable nitrate. Um, and the lack of boron likely limits nitrogen fixation. So um, the bloom of diligosperm probably needs micronutrients um, in order to take up that nitrate. Um, so bringing back to this chart that we talked about at the beginning, um, you see this decrease um, in the total nitrogen. Um, we kind of thought that that would be because of the lack of boron in the central basin. So if boron was present, um, the bloom may be able to compensate for the phosphorus enrichment. And then future experiments, we've already started another experiment on Tuesday, I think. Um, but we are eliminating some of the treatments and increasing the number of replicates so that we can kind of reduce the error, error in our experiment. Um, and it's already been determined that diligosperm is present in those samples. Those same people that worked with Michaela. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Um, just when I was looking at them, we didn't really find that many. A lot of the colonies that we found were smaller or broken apart. Um, but we did find, I don't know, maybe like 10 that were very large colonies and had more than one heterosis. Um, there was one that had like 10. But it was like a large colony that was still intact. So. What a heterosis I'm not sure why they lack pigment. Um, I think it's because um, they don't have chlorophyll, right? Or, I don't know, yeah. Yeah. Are there water bodies that have sufficient boron to keep your study specimens from being limited? I'm sorry? Can you boron? Yeah. Right? They need boron. Are there places where there's lots of boron and they have all they need? Not. I haven't 
read many papers about lakes that do have a lot of fauna, so I'm not really sure. But do you find like different concentrations of colonies throughout like the water column? Like, like do you find any colonies in the very deep part of the water column? Um, well, we didn't really sample. We just took samples from the surface water, so I'm not really sure. We'd have to take samples from different areas of the water column in order to find that out. But it'd be interesting to study. <laughs> well, um, some of it could come from just um, minerals that are involved in the water from minerals, but there's no like significant input into Lake Erie. I mean, there's no there's no pollution. Yeah, no. Yeah. Know of. yeah. There used to be one on the Portage River, but we shut them down. Well, there's a lot. There's a lot. Uh, Toledo has a lot of boron buried in the ground yeah. around it, and it leaches out of the landfills and stuff. The biggest factory up on the Portage River was not a lot. What was that we made it up? You know what? I don't remember. I don't remember what they what they did. But they were discharging pretty high levels of boron. Boron silicate glass. I don't know. Agricultural runoff, 
and uh, wastewater effluent. And once the uh, nutrients enter the water, basically acts as a uh, fertilizer, and the algae begin to grow. Um, as the large numbers of algae begin to die, they sink towards the bottom, and the decomposition consumes a lot of oxygen, which can cause a um, state of oxygen deprivation for the organisms uh, lower in the water column. They, um, in Lake Erie, see harmful algal blooms are primarily uh, cyanobacteria, which um, have low nutritional value and bad taste, so there's a decrease in available food source. And they can also release toxins, which are the uh, have that we are most concerned about. Uh, they can result in the loss of clean drinking water, increased water treatment costs, um, health issues if the toxins are ingested, loss of tourism from the unsightly color and odor, and loss of fishing business if there are dead zones created and there's fish kills. Uh, the, in the Great Lakes, most of the, or the most problematic blooms occur in Lake Erie. Um, and they previously had a problem uh, in the 1960s, but these were uh, solved by phosphorus limits that were put in place by the Great, or the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement in the early 1970s. But the algal blooms have begun to occur, and again, in the past decade. Uh, the most problematic blooms in Lake Erie occur in the uh, western um, basin and the Sandusky Subbasin, which are the shallowest and warmest parts of the lake. They also have some of the major tributaries into the Lake Erie that um, drain mostly agricultural lands, which are bringing in all kinds of nutrients. Um, and as these algal blooms continue to be a problem for lake managers, um, the need for an early warning system is um, increase, and because algal blooms can cover such a large area and, and increase in numbers so rapidly, there's a need for um, continuous real-time data, which is where data buoys come in, and there used to be a picture of my buoy on there. <laughs> um, data buoys are fixed monitoring stations that can uh, continuously record biological, physical, chemical, and meteorolo meteorological variables. Uh, that can be used by uh, lake managers, researchers, tourists, and the general public to get an idea of what the conditions are of the lake. The objective of my project was to determine if the information collected by data buoys is useful enough to be used as an early warning system for harmful algal blooms. Uh, we had two sites, one in the western basin, right out this back window actually, the, right off Gibraltar, and um, one in the Sandusky subbasin by the Sandusky water intake. Uh, right by Cedar Point. Um, the type of set or cyanobacteria that is dominant varies from basin to basin. Um, microcystis is present in the western basin and in the Sandusky subbasin. It produces micro the toxin microcystin and has gas vesicles that can, in it, so it can regulate its buoyancy. And um, it was responsible for the water ban in Toledo in August 2014. And that is a picture of the Toledo water intake crib around that time. Uh, Planktosex is extremely dominant in the Sandusky Bay, and it's also present in the Sandusky Subbasin. It can also produce the toxin microcystin, and it occurs for longer periods of time, and uh, can survive in low nitrogen wa water, and it does not have gas vesicles, so it cannot regulate its um, buoyancy. Um, samples were... Oops. Samples were taken um, once a week if the weather was permitting from July 1st through July 16th. Um, water was collected using Van Dorn water sampler to uh, take water sampling plankton identification and one for fluoroprobe analysis. Uh, the samples were run through the fluoroprobe and to determine the amount of phycocyanin, which is a pigment found in cyanobacteria, to determine the amount of cyanobacteria present in each sample. and. Um, that data was compared to the data that the buoy collected, which is you can view online. Uh, there were some differences between the, um, the data that the buoy was reporting and the data that we got from the fluoroprobe analysis, but the Gibraltar buoy um, actually produced um, data that was very similar on um, July 7th and July 10th, and on July 14th, it was close. Um, the most different values between the two, between the buoy data and the uh, floral probe analysis were on June 30th, the buoy reported a, a value that was about four and a half times greater than the uh, floral probe analysis. 
The Sandusky buoy was a little, was more inconsistent. Um, uh, pretty much all of the or most of the or the first and the third sample were about two times greater. Um, the samples were higher. The buoys reporting lower levels. Um, the uh, most inconsistent is actually the one that looks the closest. Um, it was the buoy reported a value that was actually 36 times greater than the fluoro analysis. And uh, inconsistencies that are seen on different sampling days could be a problem when you're using it as an early warning system. For example, um, from the Gibraltar buoy uh, on July 10th, the buoy was reporting values that were very close to the uh, floor probe analysis for the entire water column, except for at the surface. So it could it would be giving a warning for the, like that would or a warning for higher or lower cyanobacteria levels than there actually are present. At and also in Sandusky on July 16th, um, the buoy reported levels that were much lower than the entire water column, especially uh, lower around five meters, which is where the water intakes would be. So the buoy would rep be reporting that or cyanobacteria levels that were a lot lower than the water that actually would be taken that would be taken in. Um, even though there were inconsistencies, the amount of data that the buoy can record is still impressive and useful. It can get an idea of the uh, different changes that are happening throughout the lake. And you can see that the amount of cyanobacteria at the Gibraltar site is increasing. And um, the red points are the four um, analyses that we were able to do with standard methods of going out in the boat and taking samples. And there's just no way that any standard sampling could be used to get this much data on a lake profile. And this. Um, Graph goes till the end of my sampling period, which is July 14th. And now I'm going to change it to this one, which is the same data, but the scale is uh, 10 times greater. And I'm going to show you uh, the change from July 14th until today at 2 p.m. There is a sharp increase. <laughs> and um, this was taken, at the highest data point was taken around 2.15 this afternoon. And this is what the water lit looked like at 2.30 this afternoon. And in the Sandusky Basin, you can see the same thing. There's the same, you can see different trends. And then here's the spike. It's still increasing over in the Sandusky Basin. Um, you can see that the Sandusky buoy was a little more inconsistent. It's not in the um, same like range as the data points that the buoy is presenting. Um, the buoys definitely have, have the potential to be effective harmful algal boom uh, warning systems. Um, and as they persist, this type of information um, like real-time information is going to become more crucial to um, warning against harmful algal bloom. Uh, possible advances on this would be placing sen sensors lower near the water intake and um, getting full water column profiles of what's happening throughout the entire water column using like YSI vertical profilers or automated underwater vehicles. Um, the AUVs can go down deep into the water, can cover larger areas so you get a better picture of what's happening throughout the entire lake versus just the buoy, which is one spot at one depth. And the uh, vertical sampler, the profiler, I actually have a video of them. Yeah.
and this is how the vertical profiler works. Sends the probe down, it can do temperature all the way down to through from the surface to the bottom. And then as it raises back up, it can send signals into, into um, the water intake. And as it goes down again, it'll start. It can measure the amount of the algae that is there by itself, and as the algal bloom moves in, takes that measurement so it knows where the algae is, goes back up, sends signal into the water intake. <laughs> <laughs> and it informs them what intake they should close and where the algae is. Now they can continue to take in water. And I wanted to say thank you to uh, Dr. King for all his help over the past five weeks. Uh, Justin Chapman, who drove the boat out for us and helped with uh, samples and in the lab. Um, Greg Sinclair, who helped with shake us out on the boat. Kat, Callie, and Juliana for helping me with samples and in the lab. And the Friends of Stillman for the scholarship and for giving me this opportunity. Are there any questions? You, you've got two sampling methods. Which one do you think is the one that's accurate, and which one is the one that's not so accurate? Um, I believe that the floral probe is probably more accurate. So going out and taking a grab sample and bringing it back is, is more accurate than having your buoy out there instantaneously reading? Um, I think so, yes, but it, that's also just because we can get that picture. It's more. It can be more useful than just one depth. Oh, so the grab sample you're getting. We're taking samples from the surface down okay. to six meters depth every meter. Do you think maybe uh, the the buoy needs to be calibrated or something that I'm, would make it more reflective of the grab sample? I am not sure. It's calibrated with the It is. Yeah, Gibraltar looks pretty good to me. Um, I don't know about the Yeah, Have time for one more question. Uh, if the blue is trying to, like, if it ends up that these things do become, like, more pronounced and through it, um, detecting, like, the owl and everything, um, if they are misreading the levels of um, the algae in the water, do you think it'd be better that it gave a higher reading? Or do you think that would have? Um, I'd say a, it's hard, because if it was giving higher readings, they might start, like, doing the extra cost of treating the water when they don't need to, so that would be bad. Or they might have, like, I don't know, they might break out and close a beach or something, which would lose, like, tourism money. So I wouldn't say higher is always better, but it's maybe based on, sorry. I will be introducing uh, Thomas Rhodes. Thomas is a um, super senior, I think, or will yep. be graduating soon enough um, from the Ohio State University. Uh, I guess we were talking about, you know, good tips for people. Uh, Tom was persistent. He had actually applied for the RU project last year, but the timing came through just a little bit too late. He had already accepted another position. Uh, previous to hearing about his acceptance to the RU last year, so he applied again this year. Heard soon enough this year that he got to come in and, and work. And so we're going to now, we won't even talk about, we're going all the way to the base. We won't even, he will maybe mention the word algae once, and we're mostly going to mostly focus on uh, nutrient dynamics. And so with that, I'll let Tom get started. Well, thank you for the introduction. Uh, for the next 12 minutes, I'm going to take you on a guided tour of the fascinating world of sediment. <laughs> More specifically, the influence of 
sedimentary suspension on nutrients in the water column of Lake Erie. Uh, so I'm not going to belabor the issue of algae much longer, but we can just agree that toxic varieties like microcystin that bloom in the summer are uh, an economic burden, and they're also uh, dangerous to humans in certain concentrations, and that these blooms, al al algae blooms, are uh, a result of too many nutrients being in the water. So management so far in the last decade has been trying to look to attribute uh, where these nutrients are coming from on the land. But just a couple weeks into classes here, uh, we were met with this site, a lot of you probably can remember, um, looking at how dirty the water was. And so I started thinking about, you know, how much, how much uh, nutrient, nutrients are being released by the sediments that are all churned up in this water. So uh, um, this is in kind of a, a broader scale image. You can see this is a satellite image taken uh, five days after the storm surge from the second sash. Uh, you can see there's a pretty stark contrast between the clarity of the water here and then all throughout the central basin and into the western basin. So, I mean, it's a, pr a pretty, uh, a pretty uh, severe thing. Uh, we're not the first people to start thinking about sediment. There's been a lot of recent interest in it. Uh, for example, uh, in this publication, they suggested that uh, the total uh, nitrogen to phosphorus ratio of nutrients released by the sediment is lower than what is normally in the water column. So, I mean, if you're team phosphorus limitation, this is pretty important. Um, <laughs> another, uh, another study that's pretty important, um, or well, is a hypothesis that they had. They said that the amount of um, particle-bound phosphorus that's being loaded uh, from tributaries is comparable to the amount that's being loaded from resuspension and recycling the study. So that led me to the development of my experience, uh, experiment showing that, uh, or trying to see how if you increase uh, sediment concentration, what effect does that have on the water? And so I, I kind of guessed that increasing sediment would result in increasing uh, levels of inorganic nitrogen and phosphorus. The nitrogen being from increases in ammonium from uh, the organic matter decay products in the sediment, and phosphorus from concentration gradient. Uh, Lake Erie is very biologically productive, and so as soon as there's any uh, phosphorus in the system, it's taken out. So if there is any amount of phosphorus in the sediment, the concentration gradient would force it out into the water. So I took uh, sediment and water samples from three sites. Uh, on the 1st of July, we uh, sampled just off of the uh, point of Rattlesnake Island. And then about five days later, we took samples from the Sandusky Subbasin and the western portion of Sandusky Bay. So at each site, we took water samples of one meter using a Van Dorn sampler. Uh, we took Neckman dredge to collect sediment. We used a scupula to uh, extract the uppermost portion of the sediment that you would expect to see uh, resuspended during storms. Uh, we filtered the water and added it uh, to all these sample bottles and then added uh, varying amounts of sediment to each. Uh, wrapped the bottles in foil so that any kind of nutrients that were in there wouldn't be sequestered from primary producers and then uh, let them mix on the surface of the water for uh, one or two days. So then after the incubation period, uh, we took the samples back to the lab, uh, filtered them, uh, got an idea of how many total suspended solids were in there, uh, and then the filtrate was run through the auto analyzer to test for uh, soluble phosphorus, uh, nitrate, and uh, silicate. So the results for phosphorus uh, were pretty interesting. You can see from the S off and the SW sites that uh, there's a pretty strong correlation coefficient that the more sediments that were in the samples, the more uh, reactive phosphorus was in the water column at the end of the incubation. Uh, you can see rattlesnake, there's kind of a big jump here. Not much is happening. Uh, if you look at the x-axis, you can see that there's a ton more sediment in these treatments. So it's likely that the kind of uh, relationship that we saw here probably would have existed in between the uh, no sediment sample in the first concentration. And silicate also responded pretty well. Uh, some pretty uh, strong regression relationships here. So the more sediment that we saw in our samples, the more silicate that we saw uh, in the solution at, at the end of the uh, incubation period. So kind of just summary, 
summarizing the observations that we had, uh, kind of like the, the first uh, research that we saw at the beginning, relative to the biological needs of nitrogen and phosphorus, the sediments are seem to have a higher ratio of phosphorus to uh, nitrogen contribution to the water column. Uh, we did also test for nitrate, but there really wasn't a significant uh, increase in nitrate uh, with increasing sediment. Uh, and interestingly, I, I think the, the timing of the second session this year that we saw was pretty interesting. It was kind of the end of the spring, the early part of the summer, and this is a point where you see the transition from a diatom-dominated phytoplankton community to a more of a cyanobacterial-dominated community. And silica is a limiting nutrient in diatom growth. So it's, I don't think it's too much of an extrapolation to suggest that if you have these big mixing events when the sediment's all getting churned up, the silicate that's contributed could possibly extend the diatom dominated period and uh, possibly delay the growth of like, microsystems. Um, to kind of see how uh, relatable are the relationships that we found between nutrients and sediment concentration were, uh, we uh, developed a relationship between total suspended solids from samples tested by the Gibraltar buoy and then the turbidity values that were read by the buoy. Uh, and we're going to apply these to the um, turbidity changes between the first and second sessions and to see if the corresponding increase in phosphorus and silica that we would predict were close to what we actually saw. So on these two graphs, on the top here, you can see the first sesh, and at the bottom, you can see the turbidity from the session, second sesh. So we measured the difference from the, the pre-storm conditions to the peak of the storm surge, and we estimated that there's about 33 milligrams per liter uh, increase in suspended sediments, and uh, about 55 for the second sesh, since turbidity and suspended solids are about a one-to-one -one ratio. And so we applied these uh, total suspended sediment values to the uh, regressions that we found for our phosphorus samples. So uh, on SW here, we kind of use this as like a high estimate, and then we use this as more of the S off location as more of a conservative estimate, and the rattlesnake points kind of being kind of a middle ground that we would have seen. And so um, these were this uh, blue line here is a plot of the soluble reactive phosphorus that was tested in the water quality lab from samples taken at, at, uh, near the Gibraltar buoy. And uh, so from these two uh, vertical lines here represent the pre-storm conditions, the point after which we started, uh, we estimated the release of sediment. And then at the top here, this is what the, the peak amount of uh, soluble reactive phosphorus that we saw uh, from the storms. And so uh, the red bars were our predictions based on the models that we found. Uh, and you can see the second sesh, we were within about 20% of the predicted values, so that's pretty good. Uh, but our first prediction was uh, pretty far off. Uh, one possible explanation for that is that the uh, first sesh might have uh, turned up the sediments and maybe stripped some of the nutrients out of them. And so we were using models that were based on sediment that was uh, less nutrient rich, uh, leading to an underestimation from the first. And then kind of a more extreme example, so this is the second sesh uh, at the Gibraltar Island buoy that you saw, turbidity, and this is the turbidity from a Toledo intake uh, monitoring buoy. So we estimated from you know, nearly 500 milligrams per liter, uh, or milligrams per liter increase in suspended solids, you'd see nearly 0.6 micromoles per liter of uh, soluble reactive phosphorus that is released. And uh, typically this time of the year, if you can even detect it, um, phosphate levels are, uh, or soluble reactive phosphorus levels are usually less than 0.1 micromoles per liter. So this, this is a pretty, uh, pretty rare circumstance, but that's a pretty significant release of uh, phosphorus. And we also tested our silicate regressions uh, against what we actually saw. So again, the blue line is the actual silicate. Uh, that was measured from water samples taken from the Gibraltar buoy. And uh, so the total suspended solids that were released between the pre-storm and then the peak conditions, we took that, plugged it into our equations, and these are the values we, we uh, got for our, our estimated silicate release. And um, we didn't have the data here yet, so we couldn't really see what it did, but it's, it's pretty clear these are these are ballpark estimates. So our, our uh, relationships that we found were pretty, pretty close. Uh, 
in going through this research. Uh, there's a lot more work that can be done with sediments. Uh, we need to learn more about their, their role in nutrient uh, dynamics in the lake. So interesting studies could be uh, looking at the differences in sediment quality from the distance from tributaries. So uh, a near shore site versus an offshore site and, and how much nutrients that they release, particle size, uh, sand to clay ratios, and, and the effects that they have on nutrient transfer um, in depth. So somewhere out in the middle of middle of the central basin versus somewhere near shore where they're getting mixed up a lot more frequently. And then lastly, uh, kind of a really more broad scale study is just comparing the amount of ter terrestrial nutrient loading versus the amount of nutrients released from cycling sediment within Lake Erie. Um, I believe Dr. Chapman was involved with a study that was finishing up uh, not too long ago that was kind of looking at quantifying this. So if, if we saw that the sediments in the lake were not that much of a contributor of nutrients, then basically we solved a uh, terrestrial nutrient loading issue. We, sh we should see a significant reduction in harmful algal blooms. But if uh, these sediments prove to be a significant source of nutrients, um, then there's going to be a legacy effect. It's going to take a long time before we can see a reduction in, in the blooms. And I'd like to thank Sea Grant Stone Laboratory for the opportunity. Uh, it's been really great. Um, Dr. Chapman, Kat, and Callie for helping me with nutrient analysis and making sure I didn't break anything too expensive. <laughs> um, Captain Craig for hauling me around everywhere, and Jenna and Caleb for taking pictures and helping me set up my experiment.
think they did a, a, just a brief analysis. Yeah, it is brief, but I think we should, you, you brought up a good point that it, it makes sense for us to highlight maybe the, the supervisors associated with the projects too. Yeah, so, profiles of the faculty, because so, that so. would help the students. It would make it easier for them to choose than say, this would be my first choice. But of course, I'd love to do anything, but I think we should do Well, this, doesn't, you know, this goes beyond the REU program. So those of you that are seeing graduate school in your future, it's not like undergrad where you pick your top five schools, you send in an application, and you sit and wait for a response. Um, a good letter to reach out to those professors at those graduate programs is to spend time on their website, pull out their last five, six, seven publications. So when you send that letter to that professor, say, you know, I read your paper on X, Y, and Z. This is the exact kind of stuff I'd like to be working on. You know, you got to do your homework for these sorts of things. This isn't just an applied to this way. I sat on the grad mission committee when I was at my state, and we didn't admit anybody. We didn't have a letter from one of the EEOB professors saying, I want this student. And some of the students had lower qualifications than the threshold that was on the graduate student's website, lower GPA or lower score. But the professor said, I want this student. They were in. You were awesome. Nobody wanted you. Very different world than, as Chris said, a different world than you apply for the Um So we're getting close here, right? Final exams are two days from now, is that correct? Yeah. Right. So are there any announcements? We'll go around any announcements. Roger, you have any announcements for your students while we're I forgot to mention uh, those evaluation forms I handed out. You guys get them back to me here. So I can hand them in. Okay. Yeah. I, think I think that's how it works, isn't it? Yeah. Is that what you do? Yeah, so you should, before you go after your test, there should be, you should be getting some good that uh, evaluate the facilities and also evaluate the instructor record. So um, please do that. We take those very, very seriously. Um, we have great support from the Office of Research for some of the equipment that you worked with in just the class. But even, you know, renovations and upkeep of the lab, we really take the comments from the students very, very seriously. Um, so please do that. So do you have any um, Just uh, meet up here at 9. We'll do a presentation. Then we'll do... Um, evaluations, then you have the afternoon either be in your other class or study and final. And we are meeting in the afternoon tomorrow, so uh, have your presentations ready for the afternoon. Good luck with the studying and the exams. Thank you.